Luigi Pistilli. Divertitevi. All right. Nice. We're back, man. Uh, this is uh, another episode of An Hour to Kill. We got a special guest, Troy Howarth, with us. Uh, glad to have you here, man. Hello. Thank you for having me along uh, to talk about one of my favorite Italian actors. Yeah. Today we'll we'll be talking about Luigi Pastilli's Jolly, as y'all seen in the title, <laughs> I imagine. So, um yeah. Uh, so, I guess we'll start with the sweet body of Deborah. If uh... yeah, well, I mean that's that's uh, Pistilli's, uh sort of first foray into the Giallo. It comes in 1968. Uh, it's a very significant title because although it's not really talked about much these days, and it doesn't seem to be a real big fan favorite, it was the first real hit of the Giallo. Um, now, bearing in mind, of course, we're talking about the late 60s. This is a run of what I tend to call sexy jolly, cosmopolitan jolly films that are very much indebted to the uh, the great Henri-Georges Clouseau film from the 50s, Diabolique, which of course oh, yeah. was re remade many years later with, with Sharon Stone and Isabella Johnny. You know, terrible, terrible remake. But um, <laughs> there were a lot of films that were heavily influenced by Diabolique. There was a whole slew of films that uh, Jimmy Sangster wrote at Hammer, for example, uh, starting with Taste of Fear back in 1961 and uh, stretching all the way into the 70s with Fear in the Night in 1972. They're all variations on Diabolique as well. But uh, all of these films from the late 60s, they're not the type of Jallo films that most people tend to think of as 
uh, kind of typical Gialli. We, we tend to think of Argento style body count right. Gialli as the typical. And that's what we're going to get with, with uh, Pistilli's subsequent forays into the genre. But this first one was a big hit. It was written by Ernesto Gastaldi and produced by Luciano Martino and directed by Romolo Guerrieri. Uh, Romolo Guerrieri is uh, the uncle of Enzo G. Castellari and uh, the brother of the director uh, Marino Girolami. Uh, Girolami, I'm sorry. Uh, Girolami is the director of uh, uh, Dr. Butcher, MD, for example, uh, Zombie Holocaust, and right. of course Castellari, we, we know. Uh, but Barry Ari was a very interesting director. He was um, a little bit more high-minded than his brother, a, l- a little bit more of an auteur-type figure than Girolami uh, had been, but uh, you know, made a lot of really interesting films, including The Sweet Body of Deborah, which was uh, a movie that really kind of, it, it, it sets into motion a lot of things that are going to come very popular very shortly after, especially with the casting. We have Carol Baker, who's an American actress, uh, actually born in Johnstown, Pennsylvania, which is where I'm speaking to you from now. Right. Um, she had been a big star in Hollywood, had become very successful thanks to Baby Doll, uh, Tennessee Williams, very overheated melodrama directed by Ilya Kazan, and she starred in with Carl Malden and Eli Wallach, um, played Jean Harlow in a biopic of Harlow and uh, did things like The Carpetbaggers. Then her career kind of hit a rough patch and she just ended up in Italy, just kind of showed up on a whim and and started doing a series of movies there, uh, including The Sweet Body of Deborah, which I don't think anybody connected with it really thought was going to be a huge hit, but it proved to be very, very popular. Uh, unlike the Giallo films that had come before it, principally the ones directed by Mario Bava, which are revered nowadays, but they weren't successful when they came out, at least not in Italy. Uh, the Italian audiences didn't respond well to the, that type of film at that time. So a movie like Blood and Black Lace was not successful with the Italian public. It did well elsewhere, including the U.S., uh, but it was not a popular movie at the Italian box office. So uh, Sweet Body of Deborah, against all odds, you know, kind of a trend-setting film, also featuring John Sorrell, who again yeah. goes on to do a bunch of other Giallo films, and George Hilton, uh, who's another big familiar face in these films. And of course, we have... Luigi Pistilli playing a very sinister character who provides a lot of menace throughout the film and makes, uh, I think, a very great impression in it. Uh, Not only was it a successful film in Italy, but it did well internationally. As a matter of fact, it was one of the very few Jallo films to be picked up by a major American distributor and released in the U.S. It was picked up by Warner Brothers. Um, Didn't happen a lot with a lot of these films. They tend to be picked up by smaller distribution companies. Uh, but Four Flies and Grey Velvet, for example, you know, had Paramount involvement and, and there were a few others. But yeah, this was a very popular movie when it came out and helped to start this whole trend of movies that, uh, especially Umberto Lenzi, really capitalized on with the series. It feels, Baker. it feels very much like a Lenzi. Like, yeah, it does. Yeah. Um, it's it's definitely got that kind of vibe. I mean, it sets, it sets the mold, let's say, for that. Right. Uh, would you... Would you say that this is um, uh, my mind went blank? I'm, I'm kind of kind of starstruck right now, man. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> no need to be. No, uh, but they, this film was actually um, like was it loosely based on the Fanaroli case? Because I know there's quite a few films that that you know were kind of based yeah. on that. So, yeah, it, there, that was in the air, and there was you know, but like I said, also Diabolique was was an enormous kind of. Um, uh, influence and a, a movie that definitely provided uh, a lot of inspiration as well. There was a lot of that kind of interest at the time with the whole jet set, um, uh, you know, the, the the kind of economic boom in Europe in the 1960s, which allowed sort of international travel. People all of a sudden could just sort of pick up and go to travel places. So you get a lot of these stories about uh, Americans and Englishmen and so forth abroad in, in continental European countries. And a lot of emphasis on this sort of jaded. And it goes back to the La Dolce Vita as well, you know, Fellini's film, which kind of right. uh, turned a very caustic eye on what was going on in Italian society at that time, and a lot of the kind of uh, over-the-top aspects of it, the debauchery and so forth. So all that sort of stuff was swirling around at that time. I just thought of, of what it was. Is, is Carol Baker? She was having financial problems. Is that is that true or? Um, she was uh, she was having some issues. Her, if I remember correctly, I'm going by memory. I believe she was married to her agent, and I think her agent, as I recall, her husband um, 
kind of controlled the purse strings and uh, they were having difficulties and, and he was not, let's say he was not helping her career any. Um, so she kind of all of a sudden found herself having a difficult time getting hired. And like I said, she just kind of just showed up. She just showed up in Italy at one point and people were just, I believe it was during the Venice Film Festival, if I remember correctly, or maybe it was a can. I can't recall if she showed up in Cannes first before she went to Italy, but it was just sort of unexpected. She wasn't invited. She was, she just, just was there. And uh, because she had had this big success and it made some big films and, you know, Italians like the French are very, very cinema savvy people. Uh, right. So it was a big deal that she was there and she was available and she was ready to work. So she did a whole slew of different films, some RD type films, but also a lot of exploitation films, which she went into with full gusto. Right. So, I think with this one, okay. there's, um, sorry, Dick, um, you good. there's obviously, you know, you get early on, you get her to win like a new scene. Mm -hmm. um, I read somewhere like, you know, the Italian people flocked to the cinema, you know, because they wanted to see this big Hollywood star. Yeah kind of naked you know um yeah. and it grossed i think 587 million which is massive you know i don't you know that surely must have been in the one of the top films of the year would you say oh yeah it was it was very successful like i say it was not i don't think anybody really expect i mean anytime you make a film you you hope it's going to be successful you don't make a film to lose money but right. i think it was it was kind of a sleeper hit in that sense and much the way the bird with the crystal plumage was just a couple of years later it was not something that uh, you know, anybody necessarily expected was going to be a huge hit, but it was. And it, like I said, it it was the success of the sweet body of Deborah that resulted in films like Orgasmo and Paranoia and, uh, you know, the, the forbidden photos of a lady above suspicion and all these different types of films are all kind of in the same similar mold. Right. Uh, I do have a question, like, since we're basing this on Bastille and everything. Um, mm -hmm. So there's, I'm hearing contrasting stories on, like, you know, his suicide, like, what it was yeah. behind, what it was, because I heard something about a son died, and then I also yeah. heard uh, his wife had died. So uh, no, his uh, I think his last years were were very unhappy. Um, you know, it's it's important to note he was a very distinguished theater actor. Right. Um, he was one of the sort of primary interpreters in Italy of the writer Bertolt Brecht. Uh, he was very well known for having done a very successful production of Three Penny Opera, for example. Right. So he's a very, very distinguished theater actor who also did a lot of film work. Um, but unfortunately, in 1989, his son, uh, Daniele, died at the age of 24, uh, which, which obviously was a major blow to him. Uh, after that, he was involved with a actress and singer by the name of Milva, who was uh, with him in a number of different plays. But then they got into a relationship and that fell apart. That relationship fell apart and uh, Pistilli ended up committing suicide on the 21st of April, 1996. Uh, he took a handful of sleeping pills and hanged himself uh, in mm. his apartment. And the note he left behind indicated that he was uh, bitterly, bitterly sorry that he had said some very unkind things about Milva in an interview. Uh, it sounds like, you know, and there was another factor in this, too, that he was doing a play at the time that was getting very bad uh, notices. Um, so all this stuff kind of just, you know, I'm sure that there was a lot of depression after the death of his son, but he kind of found a bright spot in his relationship with Milva and then that fell apart. And that became a public spectacle. And then I think he was just, you know, he was in a bad place. I, It's one of those tragic stories where you think, you know, maybe if he would have, you know, hung it out, uh, hung out there just a little bit longer, if he would have just, uh, you know, had somebody he could have turned to, maybe he didn't have anybody that he could really talk to about his problems. It sounds like it was something that maybe might have passed had he not had an opportunity. But unfortunately, uh, at the age of 66, you know, he was still really a young man at the time it happened right yeah it's right it's that's tragic because like nowadays you've got a lot of people talking about mental health yeah. but i would imagine back in those days you know you just kept quiet and the whole situation with his girlfriend must have just obviously been the final straw with the after what happened to his son yeah. um but what a waste you know 66 years of age is no age really and like i said i didn't find a whole lot of information on him uh I mean, I, I love the actor. Everything I've seen him in, he yeah. he nails it. He, whether it's <clears throat> whether it's a small role and larger role, 
his yeah. range is is huge, man. Like, um, yeah, three films, I believe. I believe that's right. Uh, yeah, he was. He did a lot of television too, and obviously a lot of theater. So he was. Right. Uh, he was obviously somebody who took an interest in acting from a very young age. He was a, a theater student. Mm -hmm. um, you know, obviously had a very distinguished career. Uh, like a lot of intellectuals in Italy at the time, very left wing. So he was very much um, drawn to films that kind of played into his kind of political leanings and so forth. So he, he tended to avoid a lot of the type of films that, that were very often seen as being sort of vaguely fascistic. So he doesn't do a lot of the Poliziesco films, for example. He does, he does a few, um, but they tend to be slightly more high-minded type of films. Like a movie that's called a Poliziesco, it's really more of a film noir. It's Fernando De Leo's great film, Milano Caliber 9. Okay. Uh, and I think the reason it. that it's yeah. a great film, it's, it's out on Blu-ray, I highly recommend it. Uh, and he, and, and I think the reason he took that part was that he plays a very sort of sympathetic, progressive, left-leaning uh, kind of uh, public official in that film who is engaged in a back-and-forth kind of dialogue with a very right-wing, very intolerant, uh, sort of fascistic um, uh, figure played by Frank Wolf. Uh, tragically, both of these actors committed suicide. Frank Wolf committed suicide oh, not man. long after yeah. Caliber 9. Uh, you know, uh, very unfortunately, he was an American actor, ended up in Rome. And Pistilli followed him many years later. But I, I think it was that component that made that script appealing to him. Whereas a lot of those other films where you have macho cops running around just shooting up people, he wasn't interested in that. So he tended to avoid it. But he did a lot of Westerns. And he did a handful of Jally and some uh, interesting kind of offbeat horror films, too. Yeah, a couple of the do Dollars films, right? Uh he was in uh, for a few dollars more. Uh, he's part of Jan Maria Volante's gang in that, along with Klaus Kinski. So great, great right. group of actors in that film. Right. And he plays Eli. He fun enough, he plays Eli Wallach's older brother in The Good, the Bad and the Ugly, but he was much younger. He was so over 10 years younger than Eli Wallach. But he's uh, Padre Ramirez, who uh, Tuco goes to see. He's uh, a priest, right? Yeah, yeah he's yeah. he's out in the uh, with the monks out in the desert. So they have their great scene where um, Tuco tries to impress him and they end up, you know, having a bad time of it. So. Uh, yeah, those those uh, were were two big films that he was in. Yeah, when you said about doing this, I was was really excited though because there's virtually nothing about him on YouTube, like as far as anybody covering him, uh, mm -hmm. and on the internet as well. There's not a whole lot of information on him, so really excited yeah. to do this. Yeah, I, I think you know we were talking a little before, and it, the idea of f uh, focusing on a figure in the Jello. You know, there's all the obvious usual suspects in terms of directors and writers and so forth. But uh, let's let's give a little bit of attention to this wonderful actor who is, you know, kind of forgotten now. I mean, pop culture has a very short memory. So 1996 is like an eternity ago uh, for a lot of people. Right. And, and obviously, you know, I, I think he was well known in Italy, but he was never a big name, you know, obviously in the U.S. or the U.K. Right. Yeah, he's, and he's got such an iconic look, you know, to him as well. Yeah. Um, and his range is superb. You know, he can he, can, he plays the, the total, you know, asshole type character really mm -hmm. well. But, I mean, you see him in other films and then, you know, he can do both. Um, like I say, I, I, I was really excited, when, uh, again, like Dirk, when you said you were going to pick uh, Pistilli. Um, one of my favorites, I think. Yeah, definitely. For sure. Right. Yeah, you that's, can that's see it too, even just in his jelly. You can see it. I mean, he's a he's a hero. Uh, he's an ambiguous hero. He's a villain. He's uh, a red herring. He's he's kind of yeah. covers all the different kind of sides of the uh, the spectrum. So that makes him a very interesting actor. Would you call um, Tragic Ceremony? Would you say that's a Jallo film, or would you? Gothic. So right. it's more, nah, it's yeah. more of a more of a supernatural horror. It's a bit of a muddled mess, honestly. It was one of two films he did back to back for Ricardo Freda, right. uh, which were unhappy productions uh, by all accounts and uh, movies that Freda kind of disowned. Um, yeah, it it has it has a weird kind of hangover from the sort of Manson uh, yeah. Yeah. massacre, yeah, yeah. Uh, which which is a part of it. But it it it's um it's it's kind of a incoherent movie. Uh, there's two distinct versions of it. There's a Spanish version, which is the first one I've seen, first, first version I saw, which has kind of disappeared. 
Uh, I don't see it uploaded on, on YouTube or anything, and it's not available on video, but it's very different from the Italian version, which is the one that's now preserved. And um, the Italian version has this really weird kind of ending and so forth. It, it's a very kind of half-baked movie, but an interesting one. And, of course, Castelli's fine in it with what he's got to do. Yeah, he's barely yeah. in it, though, right? At the, yeah. I mean, he's yeah. there at the, end, in the beginning of the film, and then, if I remember right, it's, you know, he gets his head blows up or something <laughs> like something. Yeah, I think his head gets bisected by a sword, which is one right. of those scenes yeah. that keeps getting replayed yeah. over and over again. Right. So Carlo Rimbaldi special effects, uh, which are pretty gruesome, but, you know, they, they keep yeah. showing it over and over again. Right. So but. do you want to move on to the next one? Um, I'm not sure what chronicle order with the next one was. Oh, uh, well, I Pretty would correct. say uh, the next one would be Case of the Scorpion's Tail. Uh, funnily enough, the next three that we're going to be talking about were released within weeks of each other. So Italian audiences were getting a lot of Luigi Pastilli in Jallo films in, in the uh, summer uh, of 1971. We have the Case of the Scorpion's Tail and the Iguana with the Tongue of Fire, both out in August of 71, followed by Twitch of the Death Nerve or Bay of Blood or any number of other titles in Ecology September. Ecology of a Crime, right? Ecology of a Crime, the original Carnage. title, yeah. <laughs> Ecology of a Crime, Carnage, uh, Last yeah. House Part Two. you know, never right. mind that it came before yeah. Last House, but that's another story. Right. Um, but yeah, Case of Scorpion's Tale. Well, here we have Pastilli in more heroic mode. He's playing a, a Greek police inspector in this one. And it's part of a series of very fondly remembered, very slick jally that Sergio Martino directed in the early 1970s. Uh, you know, movies like Case of the Scorpion's Tail, obviously, All the Colors of the Dark, Strange Vice and Mrs. Ward. Um, and uh, this has a very good cast, but it, it's I think it gets slightly um, ignored compared to the others because it doesn't have Edwidge Vinick. Um, everybody loves Edwidge Vinick. Well, I, I have to admit, though, uh, and this might be, you know, goes against the grain of most, uh, but An An Anita Strindberg is my favorite of all the, the Jolly Queens. But uh, in my oh. opinion, her acting ability. Uh, I like her. I like her just fine. As a matter of fact, I don't see it as a problem that Fennec is not in it. My, I guess if I had to pick a favorite of all of them, I'd go with Rosalba Neri. I'm a, I'm a big Rosalba okay. Neri fan. Yeah, but Neri's awesome. Um, that's a good one as well. Yeah, that's yeah. a good one. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm a big most most, fan. most pick Fennec. You know, <laughs> she's the big one. She's the big everybody kind of gravitates towards. And I've always thought the case of the Scorpion's Tail was. Uh, it's every bit as good as the movies that flank it, you know, The Strange Vice of Mrs. Ward and, and All the Colors of the Dark, but it doesn't get talked about as much, and I think it's because Fennec's not in it. Um, but it's got a really good cast. I mean, you know, yeah. um, in addition to Strindberg, whom you mentioned, George Hilton is back. He plays a really interesting part in this. It's actually probably his most interesting role in a giallo up until that time. Um, you've got Alberto de Mendoza, who was in The Strange Vice of Mrs. Ward, and, of course, goes on to play the uh, insane mad monk on Horror Express, um, and uh, Jess Franco veteran Janine Reynaud is in it as well, who had been in Succubus and uh, Two Undercover Angels and Sadist Erotica and you know things like that. So a really good cast with an exotic setting. This one's actually set uh, at least partially in Greece, and there's some location filming, um, you know, the usual high gloss production values that you get from the Martino productions, which were produced by his brother, uh, Luciano Martino, who was indeed the paramour of Edwidge Fennec. So thus, right. this is why yeah. she was in so many of these films. <laughs> um, but Strindberg is uh, by no means a um, unsatisfying uh, kind of replacement. It's funny because right around this time, she also does um, her first Italian film, I believe, is Lucio Fulci's Legend of Woman's Skin. Oh, yeah. Uh, where she yeah. plays a major part. And I don't think she's actually building it. Um, but she's, she plays a very significant part in that. So she went up the, uh, the the ladder pretty quickly in terms of getting star billing and, and central character placement. Right. Um, yeah. Wow. Yeah, it doesn't get talked about, like you say, with, with the likes of Torso. Yeah, I got um, it. Go your ahead. voice. Um, but for me as well, I think it's, I don't know what it is, I, but it's kind of not, it's something lacking. I don't, I never put it up with those films. I always put it down as, it's one of one of one of his worst, but a worse like Martino film is still good, you know, in my books. 
Um, um, but it's going quite, up. Don't quite work. Sorry, it's gone up quite a bit for me. Like I remember the first time, it didn't really click as good. Right. Um, yeah. But after I've seen it, I think four times now, and it's pretty solid. I mean, all in all. Yeah, I think um, I'm a little bit, um, I guess if I'm going to have a hot take here, I think the one that everybody's nuts about that I'm not that crazy about is Torso. Uh, I like Torso. I think tor the last act of Torso is fantastic, but it's a little bit of a slog to get to it, I think. So I'm not as crazy about that one as a lot of other people are. So I, I actually rather like movies like um, uh, Scorpion's Tale, but also uh, The Strange or The Suspicious Death of a Minor a little bit more. than Actually, than that one went up as well because we yeah. – yeah. Yeah, uh, suspicious death. Uh, I remember not liking it at all, and then I I watched it not long ago, and and it was, I was like blown away by Casanelli yeah. and the way that they, you don't know, what this character is at mm -hmm. first, and for a long time you don't know until like I don't know like an hour in or something. Yeah, if I remember right. Uh, yeah, it's so. it's a nice fusion of kind of comedy. And uh, Giallo and also Poliziesco. So maybe it's a little too much for, for some people in terms of if you're expecting a pure Giallo, it's not that. But I'm very yeah. fond of it. Uh, but the, um, the I think, you know, as is very often the case in a lot of these films, I mean, there are a lot of um, mediocre or even poor Gialli, um, you know, that uh, that I've seen that I've suffered through. But even <laughs> the weakest of them tend to have really good scores. And that's certainly the case here. We've got a great score by Bruno Nicolai. Um, which some of the music in that film is actually recycled in Jess Franco's uh, Eugenie de Sade. Uh, there's, there's a piece of music that's recycled in that film. So, you know, actually I saw Eugenie de Sade first and I thought, oh, you know, they took the music from Eugenie, but actually it's the other way around. Um, and uh, yeah, it's, it, I think it's a fun movie. It's nice and twisty and uh, it might be a little overlong. A lot of the, I think a lot of the Martino films are, they, they tend to be a little bit on the, um, over overly long side from my point of view, but uh, they, you know, it's, it's tight. It's uh, pretty ingeniously plotted. And uh, I didn't see the ending coming personally. I, I was, I was surprised. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. For sure. Um, yeah. Hilton, he, he, he's, he shines in this one. I mean, mm -hmm. he usually does. Though. I mean, like, to be honest, I like Hilton. I, I think he's he's another one who tends to be undervalued a little bit. I think they tend to think he's sort of a pretty boy, but he's actually give him a chance to play something. You know, something like um, uh, the Killer Must Kill Again by Luigi Cozzi, where he plays a really yeah. kind of nasty character. He's really good, and he's great in Lucio Fulci's Western Massacre Time, uh, which was the movie that kind of made I him just into a got star. that. I haven't had yeah. a chance to watch it yet, but I did like since we're. I'm, I'm just going to briefly mention. I just watched uh, Fulci's uh, For the Apocalypse. Oh, masterful. blown away. Like masterful, 10, yeah. 10 out of 10 for me. Yeah. You know? But uh, yeah, one of his best. One of his I don't, top. Give, I don't just give 10s out either. One <laughs> so. of his one of his top three or four films, I'd say. <clears throat> right. So what what would you say? Would you say Don't Torture is your favorite Fulci film? Or oh, yeah. It, yeah. 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 I'm sure I read that as well. Same yeah. for me, I think. Um, like Haste by the Cemetery would be a close second. I know, yeah. of course, I'm a big fan of Zombie for me, and all them, but for me, yeah. for a long time, it was Zombie too, and and then, but now it's the Beyond. Uh, it's just something about the Beyond, and I know that's probably cliche, right. just kind of like Argento, you know, for for uh, for a while, Tenebrae was my favorite of Argento's, and now I've went back to Suspiria, and <laughs> like, I don't know. For me, it's the spirit, but um, and I know that's pretty cliche as well. But you know, it is. I mean, it's funny that you know. I think, and it's not contrarian because it's just you know, it's just honestly my my opinion for what it's worth. But yeah, um, the, the the big popular ones for all three of the major you know sort of Italian uh, horror and suspense directors: Mario Bava, Dario Argento, Lucio Fulci. Uh, I'd say the the big popular ones for for those guys are Black Sunday for Bava. Suspiria for Argento and uh, probably at this point the beyond for Fulci and I like those films very much but I wouldn't that wouldn't be my pick for any of those guys so right. uh, I'm a deep okay. red guy for example when it comes to Argento mm -hmm. and uh, with Fulci definitely don't torture a duckling uh, then probably um, New York Ripper Beatrice Chenchi and for the apocalypse but uh, you know no. there's a lot of great films I just still need to see the Beatrice uh, Chenchi yeah. yeah it's a great film 
So I guess we'll move on to uh, which one would it be? The, uh, the iguana? Yeah, the iguana with the tongue of fire, which is a Ricardo Freire film. Uh, Ricardo Freire, of course, is one of the real kind of architects of the Italian horror film, although he himself didn't particularly like horror films. But he and uh, Mario Bava were involved in creating a film back in 1956, released in 57, called E Vampiri, yes. also known as The Devil's Commandment or Lust for a Vamp or Lust of the Vampire, not Lust for a Vampire. It's a different film. Um, and, uh, you know, which was uh, kind of a groundbreaking film for the time. Actually, a movie that has some strong Jello elements in it, too. Uh, Black Glove Killer and so forth, but you know it's not really a Jallo. But anyway, um, Iguana with the Tongue of Fire was a uh, unusually. It's set in Ireland. Um, yeah, Dublin, right? Yeah. yeah, it's it's set in <laughs> Dublin. They did shoot some location stuff in in Ireland. Um, it's surprisingly even cleaned up. It's kind of a grubby and ugly film, which is is kind of surprising to me because uh, I don't know. You have uh, Freda was capable of making really fantastic looking films. He had a very good DP on the film, Silvano Ippoliti, uh, who also shot things like Great Silence, also with, with Luigi Pistilli. Um, but it's it's kind of a grubby and ugly film um, and very clumsy. It's, it's a movie that almost feels like a little bit of a send up of the Giallo at times. It has one of the most ridiculous titles uh, yeah. inspired by the Argento kind of put an animal in the title and you know yeah I, I think they missed the mark though it should have been chameleon right when you say like instead chameleon of iguana. would make the chameleon strikes in the dark let's say or something would have been so much better iguana with a tongue of fire which also leads into the most outrageously sort of casually racist comment that the police inspector says you know it's, yeah yeah the, the acids you know the, the the explanation for the well it's not only racist but also sexist you know it's it's a woman's thing and it's a colored person i can't believe they yeah. said that yeah um, you know yeah. so it's a very strange uh very strange film um which pistilli plays the lead in and uh fredo wasn't happy with that because he wanted of all people roger moore to play the inspector oh, in that film. I couldn't imagine. I could not imagine more playing that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It would have been interesting. I mean, Moore did yes. do some Italian stuff, so it, it wouldn't have been, you know, but this is around the time he's he's gearing up to play James Bond, and, uh, yeah, he wasn't about to go do a little low-budget movie for Ricardo right. Freda, but uh, yeah, Freda he's quite happy good in with it. This, he wasn't no. happy with this one at all, right? Uh, from what I no, he took his name off of it. Uh, he uh, he uses a a name that was difficult to um, trace to him for a long time because he used typically called himself Robert Hampton. Yeah. Uh, and the reason that he did that was that back in 1957, when Eva Piri came out, Freda claimed that he used to go and sort of watch people passing by the theaters, and they would always stop and look at this beautiful poster. If you've ever seen the poster for Yvonne Period, it is a beautiful poster. And they'd look and they'd be intrigued. And they'd look down and they see directed by Freda. And, and the people would laugh and walk away. And they, they because the idea was, well, what do Italians know about horror movies? I mean, we'll go watch a Hammer movie, but we're not going to watch a, uh, you know, a Ricardo Freda horror movie. So he decided to start using pseudonyms. And Robert Hampton's what he usually used. On this one, he uses uh, Willie Pareto which I believe was a reference to an Italian sort of philosophical writer. Uh, it was a strange, uh, I think he picked it just because he didn't really want anybody to know that he made this movie. Um, it's got a really good cast though. In addition to Bastille, you've got Anton Differing, you've got uh, Valentina Corteza, who was uh, nominated for an Oscar yes. right around this time. Girl knew too much, right? Yeah. 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 And, and she, uh, she was in Girl yeah. knew too much, but she's nominated for an Oscar for day for night for, um, for Truffaut. Uh, and uh, Dagmar Lysander's in it, and uh, lots of familiar faces in the film, but it's it's a bit of a mess. She's great, though. Like, her little part that she has, it cra she cracks me up. And, and, uh, oh, yeah, yeah, her she's the sort of alcoholic uh, <laughs> wife of Anton Differing, who's, who's terrific. Anton right. Differing's great. He has a fantastic freak out in the film where he... He really loses oh, yeah. it. Um, he's he's very effective too. But man, yeah. the movie's a strange. It's got a great score too. Stelvio Cipriani. It's one of my favorite Cipriani scores. But the movie's very. It's a weird film. Yeah, it really is effects. because you've got some of the POV shots, like the, the early on. There's a POV shot, and then you've got the hokiness with you know the effects, mm -hmm. yeah. and it's kind of a mismatch, like, you know. But there's some like good Melton, stuff. 
paper mache or something. I don't yeah, know yeah. what that is. But Yeah, they did some sort of strange thing with the acid in the face, and it just looks like it's animated. And then the, it's obviously like mannequin throats that are being cut all the time. And uh, it's right. very, yeah. very clumsy. And there was also, there's a weird fake slow motion scene in the film, which everybody always talks about Jess Franco doing this in, I think, Barbed Wire Dolls where he did he didn't have money to do proper kind of slow motion so they fake slow motion in in this scene but freda does it here too a uh, flashback scene which is actually based on uh something that had happened in italy the uh, uh questioning of a uh, suspected terrorist who ended up meeting a strange demise jumped from a window uh and many people believed he was pushed and thrown out wow. by the police while he's being right. questioned uh there's this kind of traumatic flashback where he's he's being rough on a suspect beating the hell out of a suspect and the yeah. suspect gets a hold of his gun and blows his brains out and there's a fake slow motion bit which is just this oh you know it's so right. hysterically ridiculous yeah. uh but there are beautiful moments too there's a great little sort of foggy chase scene uh yes. through the streets of dublin where lysander's being chased by the 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 point of view with the knife in the hand. It's very well done. But then other parts, there's all these other crash zooms into people's glasses with a really hokey sound effect on sound, like the underlining the fact that this is important. Um, yeah, it's right. a really clumsy film. And the, the is it the mortician? He's, yeah. he's, he's an odd one. Like it's, that's like yeah. a slap in the face. You know that that's, he's big red heron, but you know, like some of the well, things. The mortician, the, the chauffeur played by Renato Romano is another one. He's always wearing dark glasses because he has conjunctivitis. <laughs> I yeah. mean, everybody, everybody's just shifty, and it, it plays like a parody. It really does. It, it reminds me in a way of what uh, uh, Lindsay did later on with Eyeball, which is another movie which is just so ridiculous, oh, yeah. but yeah. endearingly so. I think Eyeball's a better film. Oh, yeah. Love I Eyeball. think that scene you just mentioned, though, so you've got um, Helen, and she's almost yeah. hit by the taxi. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you get acid thrown towards her face, and she, that chase, like you say, is just so superb. It stands out yeah. in the whole film for me, by far yeah. the best scene. Um, yeah, Fredo was Fredo was um, he wanted to be kind of like a, a Raoul Walsh type filmmaker, and he had been very successful. He made an enormously successful movie right after the war called The Return of the Black Eagle, which was like the biggest Italian box office success of, of that period. Very successful, and he really liked making action movies, adventure movies. Uh, he did a lot of sort of sort of sword and sandal type pictures and things like that. He liked doing that sort of stuff, but then doing a violent thriller like this. I mean, he'd done a previous Jallo called Double Face with Klaus Kinski, which I'm very right. fond of. Yes, yeah, yeah. I like that one a lot. That's Great. also kind of a crimmy film, one of the German uh, Edgar Wallace films. Um, it's a much better film, but this one is just I don't know. It's 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 a really weird film that doesn't quite hang together. And yet it's got enough good stuff in it and it's got a really good cast and a great score. So I revisit it every few years. And that, Oh God. Yeah. It's enjoyable. Definitely. Yeah. Like one of the closing scenes with Pastilli and his family, like, Oh God, uh, that's awful. That, yeah. It's crazy. That's horrifically, horrifically unpleasant in a way that's like, you want to have a shower afterwards. His poor underage daughter right. just screaming her head off and his acid scarred face and her pathetic looking sort of granny underwear. And the yeah. old lady who's like a Miss Marple type figure who gets her head bashed in. Yeah. Oh my yeah. God, yeah. it's horrible. It's just horrifically mean spirited. Yeah. The one thing for me as well, when I first saw this, that kind of took me out of it at the start was the accents. I'm from the yeah. UK, obviously. Yeah. Um, I'm from Wales, but the Irish accents are horrible in this. Irish. Um, Everybody's Irish. Yeah, it's yeah, really yeah. overdone. So really stereotypical, overdone. some of the things he says as well, you know, to Irish people. I still um, think oh, God, yeah. Really kill, kills the role, though, like what he does. Oh, God, yeah, he's by far the best thing, I'd yeah. say. No, film. he's very he's very good in it. There are some Irish actors in it. There's an actor, I think his name's Arthur O'Sullivan, who was actually in Ryan's Daughter for David Lean, and he was a uh, you know pretty distinguished actor. He's in there, but I'm pretty sure he's dubbed. Everybody's got this sort of awful fake Irish <laughs> accent, right. uh, yeah, yeah. which is it doesn't do the movie any any favors. But uh, it it is as far as I can remember anyway. I think it is the only Irish set giallo, so it's got that going for it. Right, right, yeah, it would be, yeah. But um, the score for me is what is, you know, mm. obviously Pastilli's performance is great, but I think the score for me is top notch, like for the mm -hmm. for the Jalo films of the time. And I find myself just going on YouTube and I'll just play that score all the time. I love it. 
Right. Yeah, I got a CD release, fortunately, which I, I picked up years ago, and it's it's a gorgeous soundtrack. Chip, Cipriani was kind of shameless in recycling things a lot, uh, but that's a really beautiful score. I think one of his best, and uh, I, I do like him a lot. So, And, of course, he's also responsible for a fantastic score for Pistilli's next one as well. So that's another connecting tissue. Right. right. Yeah. I don't mean to backtrack, uh I just thought of it though, like Carol Baker. So mm-hmm. she didn't do her own voice, right? That's somebody else's voice. Or no, that's her voice. That is her voice. Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. Cause it always sounds like, uh, I don't know. It sounds a little off or something. Uh, yeah. Me. I mean, on the, the English tracks, that is, she would have been dubbed into Italian, but it's her voice. I mean, she doesn't really talk in knife of ice for obvious reasons. So right. She has a line at the end, but that's about it. But otherwise, I mean, I'm, uh, yeah, it, it would have been her voice. The thing with uh, dubbing in these in these instances, very often it depended if the actor was available and if they kind of had it in their contract and so forth. So sometimes you had actors like Christopher Lee who would do Italian films, but it wasn't in their contract for a while until he put it in. Then he started doing his own voice. But, you know, if you see him in like the two Mario Bava films he did, he's dubbed, which is very distracting. If you're, if you're familiar with him, it's it's weird to have a different voice coming out of that, out of that like mouth. British. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, kind of a faux British uh, dubbing that they did on him, and it didn't sound quite right. Um, but, you know, in, in the case of uh, Carol Baker, yeah, I mean, she, as far as I can remember, she did her own English dubbing for all the Italian films she did. Okay. I, I just, uh, it's, it's strange because, uh, like you mentioned, Knife of Ice. I don't want to go on a tangent on that, but I think that's my, fa- my favorite of hers, or her performances, uh, playing the mute, like, yeah, so she's physically acting. Uh, mm-hmm. Just I don't know, but yeah, I don't want to go on on a whole tangent on Carol Baker though. <laughs> so, but uh, yeah, so we getting into your vice or no Bay of Blood? No, Bay of Blood, yeah, yeah, Bay of Blood would be the next one. Um, right. Which, of course, I mean, I always I like the title "Twitch of the Death Nerve." That's yes. the one I always use. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I've yes. never, that's the, that's the I've best. never seen a print with that title on it. But I don't I've understand. Seen, yeah, uh, it seems like it would sell way better. <laughs> like, <laughs> no, it's usually the the title card I've almost always seen is a Bay of Blood, which is a bit fine title too. But "Twitch of the Death Nerve" is just so wonderful. I love to say it, so I always call it that. Right. Um, that's well it's one of my favorite mario bava films it's a great kind of black comedy uh, about awful people doing awful things to one another it's basically what it is uh and pistilli plays one of the relatively few people in the film that is at all remotely sympathetic at least up to a point he does change by the end but he's he's it's almost like a kind of a macbeth and lady macbeth thing going on with him and his wife yeah uh, played by uh, claudine Arget. yeah she's the one (laughs) Like, uh, that's the ice bitch, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. she was yeah. in Black Belly of Tarantula as well, wasn't she? I think, yeah, she was. She was uh, Domino and Thunderball. She was, um, you know, she was in one of the Jeremy Brett Sherlock Holmes later films as well. Um, one of the last ones, one of the worst ones, actually. Um, but she's, um, you know, quite a striking presence, a striking actress, and uh. Yeah, she plays the ultimate kind of wife from hell who just uh, henpecks him the whole way through yeah. and pushes him into committing a horrific murder, which actually reminds me a lot, too, of uh, of Macbeth in the sense that his hands literally become stained with blood. And it reminds me a lot of Roman Polanski's movie of Macbeth, uh, which came out the same year, 1971. Uh, very bloody year for movies. I mean, Straw Dogs, Clockwork Orange, Dirty Harry, uh, what a year to be a cinephile, 1971. I, I wish no I'd been there. Yeah, man. Uh, so I know that Bay of uh, Twitch of the Death Nerve, Bay of Blood, whatever you want to call it. I know everybody always talks about the references to Friday the 13th. Mm-hmm. But something this time that I noticed, and, and I didn't know if you've ever noticed this. Uh, but I, so I'm watching. And at the very end, Simon, the character Simon. He's wearing a sweater, almost like Mrs. Voorhees. Yeah, right. <laughs> and yeah, he's yeah. The, he's got the whole mommy issue going on. It's yeah. almost like that was taken as well, because I always hear about the murders. Yeah, the yeah. Well, Jason, there's, exactly, right? exactly. It's it's it, it does 
kind of make it impossible to believe that somebody somewhere didn't see it, but it's, it's a complicated story. We could talk a little bit about that, I guess, but you yeah. know, the, the actor who plays Simon is actually, um, he's billed as Claudio Camasso as he usually was, but it's Claudio Volante, okay. who's the brother of the younger brother of Gian Maria Volante, who was famous for playing the villain in Fistful of Dollars and for a few dollars more and, and various other great Italian investigation of a citizen above suspicion one of the great italian actors yeah, yeah and he too came to an unfortunate end he was accused of of committing murder uh, he got into a violent altercation with somebody who died and while he was in prison he also committed suicide so Damn. two tragic oh. people in in this film um yeah bay of blood uh, the influence on friday the 13th um and and i'd say even more so friday the 13th part two because friday the 13th part two is the one that has the uh the skewing uh of the lovers yeah. in bed um i'm not sure it's hard to say because the um i think the most obvious fact is that in in the u.s it was picked up by a company called hallmark which is also the company that put out last house on the left and ultimately okay. they also Wrong. retitled this last house Two. last so house Sean Cunningham. Two. Yeah, he must have seen it. Um, right. But on the other hand, it was written by a guy. The Friday Thirteenth was written by a guy Victor Miller, who who does not like horror films. He's made it very clear he doesn't like horror movies. So I don't know that he ever saw this movie or not. It's it's hard to say, but I do suspect that Sean Cunningham did get a look at it. Uh, I believe that Steve Miner, who directed Part Two, certainly saw it, and and I think they might have taken some things. Uh, sometimes it gets a little bit over exaggerated. It's the same thing with Planet of the Vampires versus uh, Alien. Alien, yeah, yeah. It's like, yeah, there's there are elements, but I I don't believe that Ridley Scott ever sat down and watched Planet of the Vampires. I think Dan O'Bannon did. I think Dan yeah. O'Bannon, who right. wrote the yeah. original script, saw it and took from it. But yeah. I mean, that's that's the nature of the business. I mean, imitation yeah. is the sincerest form of flattery. Yep, you're exactly right. Uh, yeah, uh, Twitch of the Death Nerve, though. Uh, I don't know how far you want to go into it. <laughs> like, the wooded set setting, uh, would you... I mean, because yeah. a lot of people consider this the first ever slasher. and But, you know, now I know that it's probably not, you know? <laughs> like, But I don't know. It depends uh, how you define slasher. I mean, you can go back to Psycho. Uh, you go back to Peeping Tom. Both of them came out in 1960. You've got right. uh, Herschel Gordon Lewis with like Blood Feast. That's that's a right. proto slasher yeah. in a big way. Um, other examples during this time, uh, Torso, which we mentioned, is is a big big influence. I'm sure Black Christmas is is a big oh, influence. Yeah. Um, uh, so you know, one, uh, I, have, one I recently seen uh, Darren had told me about was uh, the the what is it? The spiral staircase. Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. Love that film. So, yeah. Yeah. The spiral staircase is a big influence on Dario Argento and, uh, and Umberto Lenzi. Both of them referenced it. Uh, knife of ice you mentioned is a big, uh, reference to spiral staircase. You know, the whole idea of the imperfection, uh, aspect that, that causes right. the killer to, to do what it does and images in that film, the close ups of the eyes and so forth. That was a big, big influence. So that's, that's one of those, you know, Spiral Staircase, which is a 1946 film directed by um, uh, Robert Siodmak. Robert Siodmak, right? yes. Yeah. I, I was drawing a blank for a moment, so thank you. Robert Siodmak, <laughs> who who was one of the big directors in the film noir. So it's a it's a horror film, but it's also film noir. And so this, this sort of chain from classical kind of murder mysteries through film noir into the German crimmies, the, the Italian jally, the slasher films, etc. It, it all just kind of connects Right. Yeah, there's a shot in that film with the eyeball through. Yeah, I'm right. I'm thinking straight away Black Christmas. Must yeah. have, you know Bob Clark must have seen it. Black yeah. Christmas, Deep Red, Hatchet for the Honeymoon. Yeah. I mean that that shot is is redone in in all of those films and many many others. So yeah, it's a, it's an extraordinary film. And uh, the fading, very like effective. the transition of mm -hmm. the scenes uh, mm -hmm. into the eye. I mean, and I'm watching this knowing that that's 44, and I'm just like. Yeah. Holy crap, man! Like, like, yeah. the yeah, crap today, uh, you know, there's not as I don't know, a lot of a lot of new films I'm not big on uh, compared to the old. Um, I don't know. So, Troy, how high would you rate Bay of Blood in um, Mario Bava's films? You know, would it make your top five? Would it make your top three? Top five or six, probably. Okay. Um, yeah, if I had to guess, I know. And my, my top ones are Lisa and the Devil, 
uh, the whip in the body, blood and black lace, kill baby kill and, and rabid dog. So probably maybe number six, if I had to guess, um, definitely right. it's a great film. I mean, it's a dark comedy, 100%. The ending I think is, is both shocking and hysterically funny. Um, and you know, it's, it's a movie that just it keeps surprising you because you, you start with the murder of the old lady in the wheelchair get the killer with the black gloves, pans up and we see his face. Oh my goodness. Then he gets killed. And every, you know, every yeah, time you yeah. think you figure out who the killer is, it turns out to be somebody else. Too and everybody villains. ends up killing each other off. Yeah. Everybody's killed off. Yeah, um, right. And a great cast too. I mean, uh, wonderful actors in it, like uh, Leopoldo Trieste, who plays the entomologist, um, yeah, who yeah. you will see in Godfather part two. He's the landlord that Robert De Niro has to, to threaten. Uh, in the flashbacks, whenever Vito was a young man, uh, he's in Don't Look Now as the hotel manager. Oh, um, yeah, that's right, yeah. He's yeah. in Fellini's uh, uh, Vitelloni and The White Sheik. He's a wonderful actor. We mentioned Claudine Auger. Laura Betty, who plays the uh, the spiritualist in the film. She'd been in um, Hatchet for the Honeymoon, uh, but she also won, like, the Italian version of the Oscar making uh, Teorema for Pasolini. So a lot of really oh, interesting okay. actors in this movie. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Definitely right up there, you know, with one of his best, I think. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't know if you want to move on to the next one. Did you did you uh, say that at least in the devil's your favorite Bible? Yeah, did, yeah, yeah. That's that's my favorite Bible. No, no doubt. I love it. I yeah. love it. I think it's a fantastically. Uh, it just has everything. It's erotic. It's funny. It's creepy. It's uh, ambiguous. <laughs> very, very ambiguous. Very. <laughs> Very moving in its own way. Telly Savalas is wonderful. I just I love that movie. That's that's yeah. my that's my. It's not my favorite film ever made, but it is like my desert island movie. If I got stuck on a desert island and only could have one movie, that's the one I'd want. So okay. the obvious question then would be, what's your thoughts on the other version, The Haze of Exorcism? Yeah, <laughs> uh, I understand why it was necessary because Bava made a film that just wasn't commercial. Um, it was too schlocky, quote unquote schlocky for the art house, but it was too arty for the grindhouse and, and they couldn't sell it. Um, so I understand why it had to be done. I, I think House of Exorcism is one of the better Italian sort of exorcist cash-ins in many respects. It's not as good as like the Antichrist, Antichrist Robert right? Martino, yeah, but yeah. I like it better than Beyond the Door, for example, which I think is absurdly overly popular. I find that movie very tedious. Right, um, yeah. But I, I, you know, it's a, it's hard to watch when you love Lisa and the Devil because it's just butchering it. But at the same time, it's not bad. It's got some some fun stuff in it, and yeah, I mean, it is what it is. I I, I understand. It made a lot of money, so everybody was happy at the end of the day, except for Mario Bava, who was very unhappy about that. <laughs> yeah. Was that is that Lamberto Bava that that made that happen? No, no, no. Lamberto was only his father's assistant at the time. Um, Lamberto right, didn't I mean, start directing until 1980. Um, okay. Alfredo Leone was the producer of Lisa and the Devil. I mean, to be fair, Alfredo Leone is the guy that gave Bava the money to make the film. Okay. Uh, and he let him make it. He did impose certain things. He wanted a certain amount of sex and so, so forth that Bava wasn't comfortable with. But he pretty much let him make the movie he wanted to make. But Leone was the one that said, you've got to you know, do this. Bava did entrust certain scenes to Lamberto to direct that he didn't want to direct uh, sex scenes and things like that. Even in Twitch of the Death Nerve, he would tell him, do, do that scene, you know, shoot it this way. <laughs> right. I don't want to deal with that. Um, but, yeah. you know, okay. he was trying to give his son a little bit of experience as well. Right. Okay. So would the next one be your vice? Or, or yeah. is it a white dress? It is your so, vice. So yeah. your vice... Uh, is my favorite Jalo period. Mm -hmm. Out of it's the first one I saw, and it's still my favorite. Uh, it's it's highly rewatchable. Um, yeah. It's it's probably I would say the best adaptation of the Black Cat out out of everyone that I out of the so, yeah. yeah you know I can't I mean Argento's sure surely not. I love Fulci's Black Cat. Uh, Edgar Allan Poe adaptation, but uh, I don't know. Well, most of the so-called Poe adaptations have very little to do with Poe. So there's there's right. a fantastic version with Boris Karloff and Bela Lugosi from the 30s, yeah. which is a brilliant film, but has nothing to do with 
the black cat, although it captures the kind of essence of Poe very nicely, I think. It, it has a sort of twisted, perverse thing going on. Yeah. Uh, but most of the adaptations really don't have much to do with it. I actually really do rate Argento's version very highly. I like Fulci's a lot. I think it's good. Okay. But um, in terms of getting really close to the central kind of concept, I think uh, Martino and Argento are kind of very similar in the sense that they're focusing on self-destructive men who are deliberately kind of destroying themselves and the people around them. And that's the whole point of the story, that this this kind of alcoholic, self-loathing character uh, who is uh, just absolutely insufferable and is on hell-bent on self-destruction. So you get Harvey Keitel as a sort of variation on Ouija in, in Argento's version is doing the same thing. And we get Luigi Pastilli in this film doing very much the same thing as well. He's a successful novelist who has uh, become incredibly dissipated. Uh, he's an alcoholic. He's a complete degenerate. He's awful. He's just incestuous, pointless, <laughs> incestuous mean-spirited. He's brutal towards his wife and towards yeah. his servant for no reason. Um, yes, he's lusting after his uh, after his niece. Um, although, right, yeah, it's yeah. hard to blame him in a way. It's Emily <laughs> Fennec, her most her most right. gorgeous mm. in that film. I love the the hairdo that she has in that film. It works for her very well. Um, but yeah, he's an awful, awful character. He's probably the most disagreeable character that Pistilli ever played in, in any film wanna, I've ever seen him in. You just want to strangle him, and and that speaks volumes to Pistilli's performance. Mm -hmm. I mean, this has got to be possibly his best performance, I, I think, personally. Personally, yeah, for me. I mean, yeah. such, you know, he plays that character so well. Um, yeah. But I did want to say something um, about the whole... Um, there's a scene with the typewriter... Yeah, um, and I'm thinking, did Kubrick? The Shining. This? Yeah, that's yeah. the first thing. I, I don't know. Mind. I don't know. You know, these films had very sort of patchy distribution, and I don't know that this movie made much of a dent in the American marketplace. As a matter of fact, I don't think it ever got any kind of distribution in the U.S. until it came out on DVD in the in the early 2000s through the old. Okay. Uh, yeah. I think No Shame label. Uh, they tried to release it. They retitled it as a Excite Me. What a title. Excite um, me. What's the other one? Um, something gently. Uh, gently before she dies. Yeah. 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 <laughs> and I don't think it ever played anywhere. I don't think the Kubrick had an opportunity. It's a similar thing. There was a Swedish film from the late 50s that has a lot of elements in common with Blood and Black Lace. And a lot of people said, oh, my God. But I don't think that Mario Bava could have seen it. Uh, first of all, he wasn't a big cinephile. Second of all, it didn't play in Italy. It, so how would he have seen this obscure Swedish movie? I mean, I don't think it's very likely. Right. You know, I think sometimes it's just coincidences happen. So there yeah. is a typewriter scene. Yes, you can look at that and say, oh, my God. But I don't. I find it hard to believe. I mean, I'm sure if Kubrick really wanted to see any film, he probably could have arranged somehow to see it. But I don't know. I, I, I don't suspect that uh, this was kind of his go-to type of entertainment. So I, I don't think he probably did see it. But it, it does kind of set yeah. the stage for what happens later in The Shining, yes. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, so this is top tier for me. This is one yeah. of the best. It's, I, it's not my favorite Jally, but it's got to be like non-agento. It's, it's right up there, you know? Yeah, it's definitely mine. Um, which performances, I like you say, you've got Ed Weege, Like, she plays that. It's probably one of her best performances as well because... I you think know, she best. plays that character really, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. But yeah, like I can only say positive things about this one. Um, I, I like her. I like her in it. I think Strindberg is terrific in it. Uh, Pistilli yeah, is yeah. fantastic in it. Uh, it's very, very strongly acted uh, across the board. And uh, uh, it's not my favorite of the Martino. I, I have always liked the Strange Vice of Mrs. Ward the best. No, it's a great one. Oh, yes, I do one. like this one a lot. And I yeah. again, I think sometimes it tends to get a little bit overlooked um, because, you know, most people are really nuts about all the colors of the dark and, and torso. And I, I yeah. like all the colors of the dark and torso is OK, but I think this is a much stronger film. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Exactly. absolutely. Yeah. Um, let's see. And I should mention, too, I mean, talking about soundtracks, another great Bruno Nicolai score. I mean, it almost goes without saying these movies. They, I, there's not a bad score in the bunch. I mean, they they all have terrific soundtracks. If you're if you're uh, attentive to the music in these films, uh, they're they're a gift and and an Oh yeah, they're they're to me they're fifty percent of the mm -hmm. of the whole thing, <laughs> the way it all comes together. Yeah, uh, that's something I was going to ask you about your vice. 
do you consider it any part of it like supernatural? Um, um you know, it it's ambiguous. It kind right. of it, it's it's left open to interpretation. So I think right. it is possible for Giallo to have supernatural elements in the sense of, you know, I think of a film like. Uh, well, Hatchet for the Honeymoon is is a weird example because it's not really a who done it. We know who did it, but we want to know why he done it. So that's it's kind of right. a little bit different. Uh, but that's on that plays it kind of close to the chest the whole way through until the end when it's clear it's like what well, it has to be supernatural. There's no other explanation. Uh, but there's also a movie that I'm very fond of from around this time called The Killer Reserve Nine Seats, which is another movie. Oh, yeah, yeah I love that film yeah. as well. Supernatural, yeah. uh, but it's it's Jello too. So. And then you get into like the paranormal aspects of things like Argento's phenomena or, or deep red, for example, and that's not yeah. quite supernatural depending on what your beliefs are. But um, yeah, I, I think there's, there's a little touch of the supernatural at the very least. They're kind of leaving the possibility kind of teasing it along. Right. And I guess that'd be because of Poe, right? Uh, in a way. Yeah. Although Poe isn't really, Poe is more psychological than, than supernatural. I mean, when we think of like supernatural horror, cosmic horror, you think of like Lovecraft. Yeah, uh, yeah. Poe is really more about just how awful people can be. Um, so yeah, I mean, a lot of the film adaptations of Poe, like thinking about, well, the Roger Corman adaptations, for example, he did a take on the black cat in tales of terror with Vincent Price and Peter Lorre. It's kind of a mashup oh, yeah. of, um, Black Cat and Casca Montiato. And uh, those films don't really always have a lot to do with Poe either. Because it, it, let's be honest, sometimes, you know, the idea of let's make a movie of The Raven. How? It's a poem. You know, it's, right. it's ridiculous. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The Pendulum yeah. is just a guy strapped down to a table and there's a, the thing is coming towards him. Um, but, you know, it's, uh, it, it's how you make that work and how you find a way to adapt that. Like, I think the best of the Corman Poe movies was Mask of the Red Death, where they kind of they take oh, yeah. Red Death. And bring in Hop Toad, or is it Hop Frog? I can't remember. Hop Toad, I think. And um, you know, they they create this fantastic kind of allegory, and it's a really beautiful film. Um, but a lot of Poe films have very, very little to do with Poe. Right. Yeah, Mask of the Red Death is awesome, amazing. Yeah, yeah, yeah I love it. So this, you know, if you are, if everyone's kind of had their thoughts on that film. This is one of my absolute favorites, and this took me by complete surprise. A white dress for Marielle. Oh yeah, because mm -hmm. I'd yeah. seen it on a really bad bootleg a few mm -hmm. years back, and I, I really enjoyed it, you know. And then with the release coming out now, uh, Forgotten Jolly, uh, not yeah. too long ago. I mean, yeah. this film has gone way up in my estimation. I, I, I think Dirk was a bit lukewarm when he first seen it, but it's funny about one, these films yeah. because, like, I, I can watch one. And early on, going into the to the jolly, like uh, some of them just didn't click, and then it takes multiple viewings. But yeah, I yeah. always try yeah. to at least watch something twice, or yeah. or like Stendhal syndrome. You yeah. know, it took me three times before I fell in love with. It. <laughs> so, I, I basically kept just, on to do it to keep watching it. Right? Yeah, you kept it on because me. I knew. Watch it again. I mean, that's, yeah. it out again. Uh, that's, that's, I think that was his last great film. Um, right. Although I, I like a lot of the stuff that came after, but I love the Sentinel Syndrome. I think that's great. Actually, White Dress for Marielle or Spirits of Death, whatever you prefer to call it, uh, yeah. White Veil for Marielle, I'm sorry, um, uh, has a bit in common with your vice because they're both kind of chamber pieces and and both you know kind of similar settings and chamber uh, play right they call it chamber chamber, chamber piece chamber play and very yeah. much uh again dealing with very unappetizing characters who are brought together in uh trying circumstances and then things go from bad to worse confined uh, this, spaces oh, yeah sorry. very confined claustrophobic uh sort of psychological and and at times uh borderline surreal too right because you you it's like luigi Castilli. So he starts with his character um, and he's like, I mean, he's just like looking like this bastard of a guy, <laughs> you know, yeah. and it, it's so well done the way it's because because, you know, spoilers for anyone out there. But toward the end, you can see like this broken man. He, he yeah. truly loves his yeah. wife. But yeah. uh, I don't know, man, it's just and it is heart wrenching to see him the way it is on the couch and all uh i'm not going to go into that too right. much because in case right. somebody hadn't seen because it. at the start you actually think his character is very much like your voice right mm -hmm. but yep. 
how the film yeah, it completely changes your opinion as it moves on. And yeah, Ida uh, Galley, she's not in oh, fantastic. very many lead roles, right? I mean, it's it's a shame because I, I I love her, and every time I see her on screen, uh, yeah, no, she's she's a very good actress, and I think a very interesting uh, screen presence. And yeah, you're right. Usually, she ends up playing supporting parts, sort of second fiddle parts. Uh, but this is an opportunity for her to kind of play center stage more, and and obviously, it's another great opportunity for Pistilli as well to play a substantial part because, you know, uh, in, in a lot of films, he's playing a character part or, you know, you look at a movie like uh, case of the scorpion's tail where he's, he's definitely a supporting player in that. Uh, or, you know, even Bay of blood twitch of the death nerve is very much an ensemble piece. So there's no real clear kind of lead in that film. Um, but he's, he's got substantial screen time. So in this film, yes, I do like that aspect that you have a character who um, starts off as thoroughly despicable, but by the end of it, you you kind of have some sympathy for him and you realize he's not quite what you thought he was. And that, I think that takes an actor of real subtlety and skill to pull that off. Right. Exactly. Absolutely. Yeah. That's, that's yeah. one of the things about the Jalo that made me fall in love with the Jalo is the way, you know, you, you expect one thing and then it twists on your ass. <laughs> like just it comes mm -hmm. and then it hits you out of left field and knock you out. You know, it's like, yeah. I don't know. Um, I, I like when when a character kind of surprises you. It's 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 far removed from a Jallo, but there's a really nice British film from 1960 called Tunes of Glory, with um, Alec Guinness and John Mills and Dennis Price and and the whole power dynamic in that film of of Guinness playing a character who you really like at first and Mills you don't like at all, but then it switches, and and that's right. really really interesting. You know, by the end of the film, it's quite tragic because you realize you know Mills wasn't such a bad guy. Guinness is maybe not such a good guy. So it's, it's, it's testing your kind of uh, fidelity to your loyalty to a character and taking you down an interesting and unexpected road. And that's definitely what Pastilli does here. Um, you know, again, this is, he's an actor. You know, every time you see him in anything, he can't help but draw your eye because he's very intense. He's very serious. Um, I, I don't ever remember seeing him play a kind of lighthearted, goofy comedy role. Um, I kind of hope there's there is an example of that somewhere in his filmography that I haven't seen yet. But he tended to play very serious, very intense parts, but he did it very well and yeah. always with a real commitment. I mean, this wasn't an actor who just did movies as like a lark. He thought, well, it's just a piece of crap. He, he did, took them very seriously. You can tell he really did his best to always bring something you know, to the table that was worth watching. And he always is. Uh, whether it's a large part or a small part, I've never known him to be less than good in anything I've seen him. And I've seen a good chunk of his movies. Right. Right. I can't understand why the director <clears throat> of this as well, or he, he wants the, the film forgotten from his like filmography. Yeah, Scav Scavellini. Scavellini. Yeah, I'm Romano. surprised at that because I think this film, obviously I'm a big fan of this film. Um, and yeah. I think it stands up really well. But what surprised me is, obviously we know he went on and um, directed Nightmare. Mm -hmm. Um and right. you can't tell because you, you just can't tell. But the no. one main thing is the actual childhood trauma. Yeah. And there's a scene where, she, towards the end, spoilers, I know, but she shouts out, Daddy, Daddy. Mm -hmm. And I mean, it's exactly the same from Nightmares and a Damage yeah. Brain. That's the only comparison I can kind of make. Yeah. Um, yeah. The trauma Night take, right? Yeah. 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 Nightmares and a Damage Brain is, is a strange one. I've never warmed to it. I, I can oh, never... Really? Okay. I, I just have never warmed to that film. Maybe I need to watch it again. Maybe I will at some point. But that's the movie that everybody knows him for. And, and this movie was comparatively really obscure for a long time. And now it's, like you said, it's been sort of remastered and released in the Forgotten Jallo series, which is, is yep. you know, most welcome. Uh, he was unhappy with it. it. It didn't turn out the way he wanted. Uh, I believe there was some post-production interference and so forth. So he... He's just not happy with it. But this is, a, again, a good example of why it's not always necessary to side with the director. Um, I, saw right. a com yeah. I saw a comment online today that made me laugh. And it was an announcement about um, uh, a release of Fear and Desire, Kubrick, you know, his, his mm -hmm. first film, which Kubrick disowned. Right. And somebody said, I, I believe in respecting my favorite director, so I won't watch this movie because he didn't like it. I thought, that's ridiculous. Uh, you, yeah, should, no. you should watch I, it. I have it. Definitely it. have it. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. You should watch it. You make up your own mind. I mean, uh, you know, directors sometimes pick the damnedest films as their favorites and as their least favorites. You know, Bava always said he thought $5 for an August Moon was his worst movie. I understand why oh, he's man. Oh, that. man. Okay. That's because, crazy. 
it was such an say. unhappy it was an unhappy experience for him he was thrown right. into he had nothing to do with casting it he took over at the very last second he made a magnificent movie out of it yeah but he yeah he couldn't distance himself from the unpleasantness of of doing it and also i think he got stiffed on his paycheck so i right. think <laughs> i think it was it was it. not a happy not a happy yeah. experience but it doesn't matter. I mean, you, you watch it and make up your own mind. You don't have to just go by, well, the director didn't like it. Well, okay, I can understand that, but I do. Yeah. Like um, yeah, like you're saying, Fear and Desire, I mean, it's not his greatest work, but you're seeing, to me, when I watch it, I'm seeing him kind of get his footing. He's he's yeah. he's playing with things. And each mm -hmm. film, he gets better. I'm not going to talk about Cooper, sorry, but... No, you know what I mean? it's true. I mean, you, you watch Killer's Kiss and it's it's awkward, but oh, then yeah. little flashes here and there and then you get to killing and you know, it just gets better and better. Right. Um, so, yeah, it, it's not it's not necessary to, you know, distance yourself from a film and, and say, well, I'm not going to watch it because so and so who directed it didn't like it. Well, you know, watch it make up your mind. Yeah. <laughs> that's insane to think yeah. that. Uh, but yeah, this has been awesome, man. Um, I know yeah. we're not going to get time to go through any questions, but I mean, if Troy would be up for it down the line, you know, to do another show where we yeah. can, you know, do like a, a an interview, like an informal interview and ask questions and so on and so forth. Yeah, right. I'd, I'd be happy to. Anytime that you want me back, just let me know. <clears throat> okay. So have you got anything you want to promote, Troy? Yeah. At the moment? Um. <clears throat> There, there were several things that I was able to share announcements for yesterday um, in terms of new releases that are coming. And I, I, I lose track because I've, I've got so much in the pipeline. I know Vinegar Syndrome is putting out a double feature of Marcello Avalone's two horror films from the 80s, Spectres with Donald Pleasance and uh, Maya, uh, which are two really interesting kind of ambitious Italian horror films from a period when you know, things were starting to fall apart late 80s uh, and did commentaries uh, for that, along with Eugenio Orcolani and uh, Nathaniel Thompson. Uh, I know that that's coming. I have a feeling there was something else. Oh, uh, the the Houses of Doom uh, from yeah. Oh, yeah, Aldrin. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, where they have uh, assembled the the four films, two, two by Lucio Fulci, two by Umberto Lenzi. Right. Uh, that box set is coming out with commentaries by us. And um, yeah, okay. I mean, that's, that's the case. And I've got other books in the works. I'm working on a book about Alberto De Martino. Uh, I'm working oh, on yeah. nice. a, a book with Eugenio Orcolani called Unsung Heroes, which is about directors, Italian directors who didn't make a lot of movies. So we each picked two directors and, you know, he, he's doing Giulio, Pet uh, Giulio Petroni and uh, Franco Rossetti, and I'm doing Massimo Dallamano and oh, uh, Vittorio oh. Salerno. Oh, man, that, I'm Massimo sold. Dallamano, man. I'm so yeah. on that. Yeah. 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 Um, just quickly, if you don't mind just asking one question. Um, we know, like, because I've heard you mention about doing another Jalo overview book. Yeah. Can, can you say anything about that, if it's going to be in the works? But yeah. I, know you're, I know you're pushing the time now. Uh, no, so no, quickly. it's okay. I, I have a couple minutes. Yeah, it's... Um, I just thought, and I don't know if it's going back to the same well too often. I don't know, but I, I like the idea that it's been a long time. You know, it's been a decade since since the first, you know, the first one came out. Yeah. And uh, I, I like the idea of kind of instead of doing this encyclopedia approach of going year by year, just kind of breaking it down into certain trends and giving overviews and and not looking to make it definitive and have every single film, but just kind of. You know, talk about different trends, different styles, different sort of uh, subgenres within the genre and, and, and different periods and kind of examine movies that fit into each kind of different uh, kind of theme uh, and do it that way. And I, I think it's uh, an idea that I like the idea of doing. And I, um, yeah, I'm planning to do it sometime, uh, maybe this year or next year. Okay. Oh, I look forward awesome. to that. Yeah, I love it. Yeah, awesome. I, I did want to ask you one one question. Uh, yeah. What is the one Italian film that that got you into the Jolly? Like uh, that hooked you in? That you know, like, <sighs> or or Italian horror? Uh, well, Baron movie. Blood. Baron Blood was okay. was uh, I think the first Italian horror film I ever saw. Um, I you know I was very young. I was I was absurdly young, and I had no idea who Mario Bava was or right. what Italy was. If it came to that, I was just a little kid. But I, there was something about that movie that just absolutely entranced me. Uh, and and over time, that made me want to explore other films. 
Um, growing up in the 80s, you know, uh, TV yeah. stations occasionally ran oddball European kind of Italian and Spanish movies. Um, things like Night of the Howling Beast and Lady Frankenstein. I think the very first Jallo I ever saw was the night Evelyn came out of the grave, uh, which oh, used to oh, show up on no. yeah. Channel 9. Uh, <laughs> cut to shreds. Yeah. It didn't make any sense and you know, all that. But, I mean, you could just tell watching these movies. Uh, I, I couldn't articulate it at the time. I didn't understand, you know, the whole concept of dubbing and everything. But there was something that was weird about these movies, the way they sounded, the way they looked. And, um, you know, uh, Black Cat was another one. Full Cheese Black Cat was another one that used to show oh. up on TV. And, uh, yeah, it's just kind of a gradual thing. I always loved Hammer. My mom was a big uh, fan of, of horror movies, and she loved Hammer movies. So um, I, as a child, I mean, Peter Cushing, Christopher Lee, Boris Peter Karloff, right, yeah. Bela yeah. Lugosi, Vincent Price, all these people were, like, you know, part of my childhood, and they feel like family to me. So right. I've always loved that sort of stuff. My first Italian horror was uh, I was probably 10 and it was buried alive, a AKA beyond the darkness. Yeah. <laughs> and Joe DeMarco. Yeah. Yeah. I shouldn't have been watching it at 10. No. <laughs> well, maybe not, but you know, I, I know in the UK they're much more strict than they are in the U S So my, my parents yeah. had no difficulties letting me watch horror movies and, and so forth. Right. But, uh, uh well you know i'm not a violent person the sight of blood in real life makes me ill so it's right. it's okay yeah. well i'm old enough because we used to have right? the like hammer double bills on bbc2 yeah. on a friday mm -hmm. night and i used to look forward to them yeah. um they're not quite my film you know i got a hammer i can watch and i can enjoy but they're not quite my film i'm more of a jalo and slasher you know mm -hmm. guy, but um but this has been awesome man yeah, yeah man absolutely been awesome great been looking forward to this the the day you were agreed to do it but um yeah like i say you know you're welcome back anytime and and next time we'll have some questions and and uh i'll get all of you down the line um but thanks yeah, again joy for coming on yeah I really appreciate your time no um, thank you thank you it was a pleasure talking to you both uh nice nice meeting you dirk i don't believe we've ever spoke before and uh right yeah no it was very nice and yeah just let me know uh we'll we'll make arrangements to do it again Okay. okay. And, thank and if, you, there's, thank you. if there's I, anything, if there's anything you want me to put in the description, just let me know. Uh, I, I can do that. You okay. Know. Sounds good. All right. Appreciate you. All right. Okay. Thank thanks. you. Thanks. Mm, bye bye. Thanks. Sorry. Bye, bye. bye. All right. That was awesome, man. I mean, that's surreal to to interview someone or to talk to someone like you yeah. know. He's kind of an idol for us, really. Yeah, yeah. It's like oh, you could probably tell. Uh, I was like you, mine was a bit starstruck, yeah. if I'm honest. Um, right. Yeah. But I, yeah, I gotta, con consummate professional, mind the way he's like. Yeah. He knows a lot, a right. hell of a lot. Yeah. Um, uh, I got to take a break, man. Do you need to take a break or anything? Yeah, I could take a toilet break and then we'll come back. If, I will, if, uh, put like, obviously, on we'll the... talk to the chat. There, yeah, I got plenty of messages to go through. I'm sorry, y'all. Yeah, sorry, we, guys, but we we're... have to try and make the most out of the time. Right. Um, we try, but you know, yeah, we'll get back to them now. But I'm gonna put a an intro on till we get back. Okay, anyway. no worries. <laughs>
Sorry about that, yo. Man, that was awesome. Uh, just going to go through the chat a little bit, man. Sorry, but uh, we're kind of limited on time, so. Um, let's see. My beautiful wife, signing stream. Yeah. Very much so. <laughs> Uh, Texas, once again, congrats on the pan to the panel of pain. Yeah, man, oh, appreciate it. it. And I and I'm sorry, man, of uh, leaving leaving the chat out. Uh, just like yeah, because like, we, we basically had just over an hour, right? Um, but any questions, and that I'm sure, like you say, you, he's going to come on again. Um, right. yeah, that was just awesome, man. Yeah, man, yeah, <laughs> that's something I'll go back and replay. You know, oh, I don't yeah, like no watching doubt. myself on stream or anything, but in terms of the guest and that, that is just, yeah. So, yeah, man, it's, it's like overwhelmingly, surreal. like, you know, all the damn information overload, like, holy shit, you know, like, I mean, it's there yeah. in his head as well. He's not reading. Yeah, it. He's not it's, looking at notes. It's, it's just amazing. There. <laughs> like, holy shit. Um, so yeah, guys, let us know if you like that, you know, yeah. I was trying to keep like talking down to a minimum because I want to try and get as much out of Troy as we could. Yeah. Um, but yeah. That's awesome. Uh, so everybody's saying, hey, got James Van Dusen. Yeah, man. Hey, man. What's going on? Glad you're here. Um, you got Holland in here? Hey, Holland. What's going on, Holland? Uh, let's see. Wild Wrangler. What's happening, man? Hey, Wild Wrangler. Horror of the month, yeah, man. Uh, it's it's humbling, really, man. It's it's pretty awesome. I mean, I had a lack of sleep last night because <laughs> I was up to like eight o'clock. We was um, doing a stream and that, but yeah. yeah, it's it's fantastic. I'm really pleased with with winning it, you know. Right. But go and do your votes if you haven't. You know, these four coming up are great as well. They've yeah. all got their own different, you know little ways and, and different videos and that so you got the mayor in here what's going hey, on man you got reed in here hey i know this is way behind we're like an hour hour something behind on the chat but i'm trying to make sure i catch everybody man um i didn't even get to the i mean i showed him uh talked to him briefly before the stream but uh i was gonna show him you know all the books and everything but yeah yeah next time we can just basically do uh, like just questions because yeah. i'm sure we've got loads well i know we got loads as well um but yeah, yeah. um yeah my wife's obviously. saying glad y'all here yeah definitely yeah man yep she is tight 71 hey now let's see uh that pug wall 316 it's really cool you are covering so much yellow I'm always growing my collection and growing down, going down rabbit holes for directors and actors. Thanks, guys. Yeah, man. Uh, well, hey, we're constantly learning too, man. Like, uh, I thought. I mean, you think you know some shit, and then then you realize you don't know that much. <laughs> like, you know, shit. I mean, it's uh, just a shame. Um, yeah, thanks for <laughs> yeah. that. Uh, good comment. Um, but yeah, he does put us to shame, man. Um, <laughs> it's just so natural as well with him, yeah. you know. Yeah. Let's see. Um, let's see. Yeah, man. Yeah, yeah, man. Yeah, man, definitely. It's yeah. good to have some new like faces as well in the chat, uh, yeah. new names and stuff. Yeah, I've uh, he's he's got a channel. I've, I've checked his channel out uh, recently. He's he's got some good stuff over there. Oh, I'll have to I'll have to sub. Yeah, we got um. Yeah, y'all sub up to Pugwall 316, man. Um, Texas, sub up to him too, man. He, he, yeah. He, he's doing I want a few to see things. more videos from Tex, to be we honest. Got, we got Brian Go Blue in here. As well. Hey, Brian. What's going on, Brian, man? Um, Anthony, what's happening? Hey, what's going man. on? What's up, man? Yeah. Let's see. I'm trying to, trying to get there. The Wild Guys. Yeah, man. Me love Edwidge Finnick. 
Rosalba and other 70s hotties, of course, Suspiria, Goblin. Yeah. Absolutely, man, 100%. I was surprised he said Rosalba Neri was his favorite. I yeah. mean, that was really cool. Yeah. It's, he has yeah. got, uh, you know, they stay for Nets, like you said. Neri's, she's great, man. She's she's a very strong actress, though. So, yeah. Um, Hopefully we're going to do a stream on her because I know we've watched a shitload of her films. Right. And see, uh, Texas... Just saying, hey, just notice your shirt, way cool. Oh, yeah, man. That's my favorite film, man. Or my favorite Jalo, I should say. It's not my favorite film, period, but my favorite Jalo. So, was you taken aback when Troy said um, he didn't think a lot of Torso? I was a bit shocked. Um, um, I mean, I kind of can see why. Cause yeah, kinda, yeah. Because, you know, yeah. I'm not that as big on Torso as the other Martino. Uh, right, like, uh, yeah. Like I put Strange Vice above Torso. I'd put, of course, this one above Strange Vice. But I think Torso comes in third for me, uh, out of Martino. Right, yeah. You I know? think Strange Vice was his favorite as well. Was his number one Martino? So yeah, yeah. Um, oh, I've got to ask him about the book as well. About doing the Martino book, but we can ask that next time. Yeah, that's that was something I was going to ask. Um, I forgot. Let's see. Yep. Excellent stream, guys. I look forward to seeing Troy back on the show again. He's very knowledgeable and a great guest. Yeah, man. Yeah, yeah he really is, man. Yeah. yeah. Jesus, Anthony. Yeah, man. Appreciate it, man. Uh, that was cool. Check your pants, guys. Make sure they're not too much piss on them. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> right, you can tell early on yeah. as well. He's a bit starstruck, I think. Right, yeah. But once he got like you know, he like Troy did most of the talking anyway. Um, right. Texas says uh, this was excellent. I'm glad you had him on, and looking forward to seeing him again. Yeah, yeah, man. Yeah, I think Texas has got his books as well, did not he? I know he's got yeah. his last two. Yeah, he bought the. Uh, you know, Texas said he bought these from when I showed the. That's right. Yeah. So yeah. deadly, so perverse. Um, yeah. But that agenda book you got is is a beast of a book, isn't it? Yeah. So uh, really I can cool. show I can show that. I know I showed these recently, the the Baba and the and the Fulci, but I just got this. I didn't have it, so like, why why don't I have this book? It's uh, almost twice as thick. Yeah, I have it now. So I love that cover. Murder by Design, Dario yeah. Argento, Sucker's Thick. Yeah. So, yeah, go out and buy, you know, support his books, man, Troy Harris' yeah. books, because they're all obviously on screen or dotted around, you know. Um, and anything that catches your fancy, like, definitely support that guy because he's doing things, you know, for Jalo films that not that yeah, many man. people are sticking their headache for. So, yeah. Let's see. Uh... Let's see, James Van Dusen. Thanks, guys. Awesome show. Yeah, man. I appreciate yeah, man. it. Yeah. Dark New Skull. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I just got. It's not new. It's just I put two of them on there. I, I don't know. I was feeling extra cocky, I guess, after we won horror YouTuber or whatever. No, but not really. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, let's see. I've got a couple. New ones in the works, and I'm on Cinephile Sanities tonight for a Repo Man watch along. Awesome. Nice, awesome. man. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so uh, I think uh, JT, he wants me to come on a watch along tomorrow night. Um, yeah. For, um, damn, what was it? Damn, it's too much stuff going on. I'm trying to remember now. Drawing a blank. Damn it. Is it horror or is it non horror? It's, it's, oh, Taurus Trap. Taurus Trap. Oh, nice, man. Yeah. 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 So he wants to, he, he wants to do a watch along Taurus Trap. Um, and then Tuesday night, I'll be going on Gorafo's channel and we're going to cover, um, uh, A Clockwork Orange. Nice, man. I look forward to that. Yeah. Yeah. I need to watch that again as well. I'll watch it before you do the stream and be interesting to go through. Yeah. 
And we're, um, we're... you've got to get JT. You got to ask him on on you because I think he'd be a great guest as well. Yeah, man, for sure. But obviously, pick something that he wants, and um, but I got something coming up with Dana as well. With so on Thursday night, we're yeah. going to be talking um, Haunted House of Horror and the 1975 Deadly Strangers with um, I think it's um, Haley Haley Mills. So it's on YouTube. If anyone's interested, I, I love that film. Um, and then we got a lot in the works now with Dan as well. With this new, you know, with Gorophobia, Dan, me, and Dirk, we're going to be doing quite a bit uh, grindhouse style films. Yeah, on, Dead End and Driving. That's going to be on Visited by Voices One channel. Yeah, it's called the Dead End Driving though. Um, is the show. Oh, um, Wild Wrangler just asked. Yeah, I, I love Tourist Trap. I'm a massive Tourist Trap fan. I think that's oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. really underrated. Very weird film. Probably Full Moon's best film. <laughs> oh, by a mile. By a mile. Um, and for a PG, mine, that was a PG film. It is yeah. very dark. Yeah. Uh, well, PG I was, believe that was PG. PG was different back then. Right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I can imagine, but um, that's honestly, I think Tourist Trap is one of the forgotten kind of slasher films. Yeah. Love um, that film. Yeah, Texas says uh, faux Tourist Trap. I'll be on there as well. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Awesome, man. Awesome. I'll be glad to join y'all, man. That's going to be fun. Uh, been a while since I've seen Tourist Trap. Been actually probably two two or three years since I've yeah, seen it. Yeah, so, about uh, the same. Yeah. Yeah, love I'm course, trap. yeah. Um, yeah, man, yeah, taking it back, man, a little bit. That was an awesome show, really. Yeah, I'm definitely gonna be going back and listening again because he right. did mention a film, I can't remember the title now, of um, like an old British film that sounded really right at my alley. He mm -hmm. said it's not a giallo, but it's kind of got you know, um. So I go back right that day. And what then, is that? Uh, Fulci, the Beatrice Chinchi? Sensi, yeah, yeah. Um, have you seen so, that one? I've not seen it. It's um, okay. I think it's kind of got horror elements. It's not a horror film, um, but I know he's massive on that. Troy right. loves that film. Um, absolutely, yeah. Okay. I have got a couple of things to show off. Nothing, nothing too too extravagant. Yeah. Um, so obviously, they, everyone knows this one. Um, the Spanish bloodbath came in last week. The three shallow films, oh, yeah, yeah. So, Mine, got, mine's on the way. So, Night of the Skull, Violent Bloodbath, and The Fish with the Eyes of Gold. I mean, we're going to be see? covering it, that, aren't we? At some point, oh, yeah, put you on the big solo. There, there you, you go. go. Um, yeah, let's just do this. Uh, same artwork, I guess, but yeah, okay. So it's just one case, then okay, yeah, yeah, so which kind three... of for the price, you know, was 30 pounds UK, yeah. So that's like, yeah, yeah. I did get this thing, which I'm really excited, I've never seen it before. The Sex of Angels, it's a giallo film from 68. Oh, wow, okay, and they sent me the the cover in a different case for some reason. The Weird. Cover. That's vinegar. Um, no, I think this is an obscure one actually. Um, my eyes are terrible at the moment. Um, but yeah, just do a good Google search. The Sex of Angels is pretty much available. Okay. I got it on uh, Strange Vice is a website. It's a UK website. Yeah. But yeah, another one for the Jalo collection. So happy to get that. Okay. But I'm still buzzing, man. After last yeah. night today. Yeah, and I drank uh, some coffee before I came on. So. <laughs> like, well, yeah, yeah. It yeah, might not have been the best uh, more, idea, but. <laughs> but... <laughs> yeah, because we both don't drink alcohol anymore. Because I like, so. I had a bunch of things in in the head to to bring up and mention, and then like. You know, it was like, what the shit? All that shit went out the window. But, uh, yeah. It kind of shows you how hard it is, like, like Dead Pit do it so well. 
when they yeah. get guests on and right it is kind of hard to do because you don't want to talk over them you you want to give yeah. them and but then again you don't want to like kind of be silent um and it's like that fine line which will uh, ensure I'm, I'm hoping we'll master at some point and but um yes yeah, dope man still buzzing like i say still buzzing yeah Taurus trap notice any jelly in it um I guess you could say yeah, kind of elements There's with the dolls. Elements. Certainly with dolls. Dolls is a big thing in Jalo film. Yeah, yeah, with the mannequins and shit. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But it's uh, definitely a supernatural uh, horror, I would say. Uh, yeah, and no, I tell you, talking supernatural about slasher, about, right? That's, yeah, that scene, that opening scene when he's in the gas station, yeah, and you got the fucking like poltergeist activity or whatever, and you got things flying at him. That genuinely shits me up. Even watching that today would shit me up. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there, there's you some can't very, say that about many films, really, can you? Like very this. disturbing moments in that. Yeah, film. yeah. The damn that oh, shit with the fucking like, like holy yeah. shit, man! Like yeah, man. It's so um, and then Chuck Connor just like the way he's looking around and shit and moving shit, you know, like with his mind. It's fucking insane. Is it his performance is that in that is fucking insane yeah. as well? I mean, right. and there's Texas Chains, like the look of him as well, kind of reminds me a little bit of Leatherface. Um, yeah, it's Definitely. yeah, there's Definitely. loads to love in that film with a weird voice he's using. Uh, yeah, yeah, I right. see. Uh, Anthony says, Taurus Trap is awesome. I also love Puppet Master One through Three and Demonic Toys from Full Moon. Yeah. I've seen Puppet yeah. Master one. I I didn't. I wasn't a big fan. Yeah, I think um, the I think two two and three are stronger. Like okay, I'm I'm, yeah. I'm not real big on. I mean, when I was a kid, I loved all that shit. Uh, I still I still would watch uh, Puppet Master though. Today I haven't. I know I've seen Demonic Toys, but it was never real big for me. Um, but yeah, those are kind of fun. You know. I'm not massive on the killer doll thing, though. Yeah. Really? Uh, I don't know. I guess when I was a kid. I, it, yeah. It was I mean, Child's Play, I'm not. Ma I, I like it for what it is, the first one, but I'm not massive on it. But I prefer the original, um, the part two to the original. But um, right. I've never been. There's another one called Dolls as well, isn't there? Yeah. I think I've got a blue I've never seen. But uh, they kind of always, every time I see one of them, I kind of get disappointed, so I don't really bother. I don't seek them out as much as I used to. What about Trilogy of Terror, though? You ever saw that? Yeah, yeah. I like the Zunani doll. Yeah. The one. <laughs> I mean, that's killer. Karen Black, yeah. Yeah, yeah. The other two stories, not so much, I find. But um, it's worth it just for that that one segment, yeah. I love Karen Black, though. Uh, oh, God, yeah. yeah. I do. Uh, let's see. Uh, Wild Wrangler says, Anthony Bott. Anthony bought Puppet Master one through three for twenty. Uh, oh, okay. Like, I like mean, two. that's definitely a good price. Yeah. yeah, it's not bad for three films. Not at all. Child's Play two is great. I think so. Yeah. yeah. I I prefer the first Child's Play. It, it's I don't know. I it's still, darker. It's it's yeah. very dark. And it's film. like. The first, I just maybe when I was a kid because it or younger, I should say, uh, it hit a little harder because it plays the whole thing where it, you know Chucky's not this funny thing yet, you know, right? Yeah, and, yeah, and you don't know if if it's Chucky or you don't, and you don't know if it's Andy, you know, right? Yeah, like yeah. you don't know if it's the kid doing this shit, you know, <laughs> like so, uh, yeah, but. Well, I remember when it came out, man. It was a big deal, for sure. I mean, I've only seen it once, mine. So I've never, okay. you know, I, yeah. I'd have to give it another. The whole go. mystery to it is, I think, more intriguing to me. Like when I was young, you know. What do you think of the third one? It's okay. Isn't some kind of army cadet? Yeah, it's all right. rightly. Yeah, yeah, it's not great. Not great. Let's see. Uh. uh First Child's Play is my favorite as well. I like the serious tone and the right winter set. Yeah. It's definitely, yeah, more serious. Yeah. 
got Psycho Manis in here. Hey, uh, man. I have a question. Do physical media collectors today, uh, are they after the films or the correcting aspect of the hobby? I'm actually, I mean, I think it's a, a bit of both. There's, and it depends on the person too. Like, you know, there are some people that just, I, I think maybe more than half of it has to be the packaging. But to me, at the, at the heart of it, at the end of the day, to me, it's the film that's the most important. <laughs> like, uh, the packaging's nice. That's kind of like a cherry on top for me. That's just yeah. me. Though. Uh, but the film, at the end of the day, is the most important. Uh, so, Yeah, I'm probably the same. The film is the most important part. Yeah. You know, we all love a good box set and a good, you know. Yeah, slip, that's all nice, cover. shiny, uh, you know, something to look at. I think there's a lot of YouTubers or blue tubers that just buy shit just to say they got it. Yeah. Um, I mean, that's like, fine. Like, if they, that's what they like, you know, who am I to say what you like, what you don't like, you know? Um, but yeah, but that's what I'm saying. They don't particularly watch them, I don't think. Yeah, yeah. Just, it's kind of just... like, uh, you know, back in the day when I collected comic books, there was only certain titles that I actually read, you know? Yeah. yeah. Other ones I collected just to collect them. Like I didn't read them. I, I was, you know, keeping them. Right. Yeah. Them. Yeah. I don't know. It's a weird thing. It's a weird thing. <laughs> I mean, I try to watch everything I buy, but you're going to yeah. get like some that slip through the hole and you kind yeah. of look a year later and you think, why haven't I watched that? But it's just time. Time consuming right. really. Anthony's asking about, uh, monkey shines. What are we thinking about monkey shot? Never seen it personally. Uh, yeah, I remember. It's a you know George Romero. I remember. I liked it as a kid. It's been it's been. I haven't seen it since I was a kid though, so I can't really give you. A, uh, I do remember it being creepy as shit though with that damn spider monkey and a dude in a wheelchair. You know, it's kind of like depending on this monkey to do shit for him, if I remember right, and uh. I don't remember everything though, so I can't really say all the way. But one there, I remember there from... was another one as well, probably at the same time on a Shakma, I think it was called. Yeah, yeah, Shakma. And of course, you got Phenomena that features the monkey yeah, yeah. as well. A couple of years before that. Sorry, Dave, what was you going to say? Oh no, no, I was pretty much done. Um, let's see. Uh... Okay. But yeah, man. Uh... Anything y'all want to bring up? We're just kind of like, we're just kind of here now. <laughs> like, uh, Shoot the shit again, basically. If anyone got any questions, just stick them in yeah. the chat, man. Um, yeah, we can hang out for yeah, a little we while. Could talk. For a little bit. Do you want to talk about what we got planned for our next stream? Or you got any thoughts of what you want to do? Yeah. Um, I think we're going to hold off, are we, on the Martino for a bit? Yeah, we're going to hold off on Martino. Uh, we've kind of been going through Martino quite a bit here, like, um, so yeah, I don't want to get, I don't want to wear Martino out, burn him out, you know, right? Because um, I think you said you want to do something like start doing some films we've never seen, yeah, before, like new watches, which would be cool, definitely. I definitely, because there's so many films we haven't seen, I definitely want to see, like, get on some something we've never seen something we can really dive into and uh yeah continue the the library man of uh watching these great films finding trying to find the 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 best you know yeah the it's two like, box sets come to mind like the jolly box sets has just yeah. come out right um i think that'd be good charlie got a good question there have you seen a knife for the ladies i do have a bootleg of it I've never seen it. Okay. But I've used, I've always used, isn't it like, I think it's a 70s film, but I've, I've always used good things. Okay. Yeah, I'm not familiar with that at all. So. Yeah, Google the cover, man. It's pretty, it looks pretty badass. Okay. Yeah. But, yeah, man, that was, uh, that was awesome. Yeah, again, I can't wait now until we get him back. Um, 
I'll leave it a few. We'll leave it a few months. Don't want to keep bugging him. Like, but um, yeah, we'll just have a load of questions for him next time. And and uh, you know, like like uh, Darren was saying, we got the we're on the we're gonna be on the dead end drive in now. Uh, there's gonna be some some pretty good films we're talking about. I mean, Gore folks gonna be on there. Um, yeah. And I know Dan's going to be on there, but I'm 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 not sure. Maybe somebody else. I don't want to say because they might not be there. So uh. I think I I don't think Dan would mind me saying. I think they're trying to get uh, Lauren said he he's going to come on when we do Martino. Yeah. yeah. Um, and that's a good reason to hold off doing Martino right. at the moment on our channel as well. Yeah. So I'm super excited to be doing a stream with Lauren. Um, but that, all that looks exciting as hell. Dan's idea and. Yeah, Lauren's getting as many people on as he can, you know, different people. Right. Um, I'm really excited about that project. I think there's going to be some good double bills. Um, and Gore seems, you know, really like enthusiastic as well, which I like. He's really up for it as well. So, yeah. Yeah, man. Yeah. And if y'all haven't voted yet, man, y'all go vote uh, in the four new nominees for Horror YouTuber of the month of April. Yeah, check out our video we did yesterday and give everyone a good like watch. Yeah, I got their links there to their channels in the description. And um yeah, I suggest checking them all out. Sub sub to all of them. Uh, good stuff. That's right, Charlie. Yeah, I remember I remember someone telling me it's a Western with Jalo elements. That's why I got it. The bootleg. Yeah. Let's see, uh, okay. That's what kind of piqued my interest in originally for that film. Okay. That's kind of like uh, that film that I watched not too long ago. Uh, was it Four Bullets for Joe? Yeah, it could be. Yeah, it could be. Yeah. yeah. It's kind of, I think it's like 74, I want to say. Okay. This was in the 60s, though, that Four Bullets for Joe was. Um, early 60s, I believe. Might be in the 50s. There's know. a couple of Jalo um, westerns. There's um, a pistol for Ringo is one of them. I think there's yeah. a two two Blu-ray set of Ducio Tatari does like the two Ringo films. I've always yeah. wanted to check them out. Um, like pretty much basically Jolly western. Yeah. But I was trying to get older. I think trying to get older that release down the line and um, might have gone out of print or something, but. Well, yeah, man, I, I got to echo, you know, like the support that we got has it's, it's been amazing. Like everybody's been super cool, super awesome, uh, super enthusiastic. Like, uh, it's really it's been, Yeah, yeah, definitely. It's really humbling. I, I got to say, man, it really is. Um, I really appreciate everybody, man. It's cool. And it seems like yesterday as well when we were first talking about doing yeah. this. We did the first, uh, we, the first one we did was Lindsay. We spent like a month uh, watching Lindsay films. I must have watched 30, 40 Lindsay <laughs> films or some shit. I think uh, I did 14 in a week, the week before. Right, right. I did like 14 in a week, which is yeah. crazy, man. Yeah. But I still got fond memories of a lot of those early shows we did. Yeah. I think everyone, like, not, not, you know, I think they stand up quite well. Considering right. you know we're trying to do stuff different to to most people on on here, yeah. Um, talk the devil is Gore himself. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, we got uh Gore in here, man. One of the nominees. Yeah, check What's out, going on, man? subscribe, and all that. Yeah, definitely. Five card stud is also supposed to be a Jalo Western. Okay, okay. Oh, I've not heard of that one. Yeah, I'm all about checking out stuff, man. Um, yeah, it could be could be a future show. Right. Definitely, yeah. What do you uh plan on you plan on watching anything tonight? Tonight? Yeah. Um I'm itching to get to like the the, um, the Jalo box sets. Um but I don't know if to hold off until we cover them. I'm kinda like that. I'm funny like that. Um yeah. it's weird I am anyway. And then yeah, I'll kind yeah. of hold off on certain things. And mm -hmm. next thing you know, it's like fucking two months down the line, three months, and you think, shit. Yeah. Um, I don't know, but I'll definitely, I'll see what's on, what people's content on YouTube first. 
um because i'm a ma- once i get started on streams on youtube it, like oh yeah it's hard to get off and, and watch a film yeah man and that's a, that's something else i like i have i have a family so in in my time between work family and everything i try yeah. to try to get everything try to make it manageable you know uh I mean, you do great with what you do. You know, you've got obviously got a young son, you know, yeah. um, Tasha as well. Yeah. But yeah, I'd find it hard. I think if I, you know, my my son's completely grown up now. Yeah. But um. But yeah, yeah Grace you do great, you know, man, for what you do. I appreciate it, man. I think I'm like, you know, I have all these films that have come in and everything. But one thing that that I'm, I'm I seem to be drawn to that I'm probably gonna watch tonight i'm probably gonna watch two films tonight and one of the films is gonna be uh clockwork orange and then i'll start digging in on that but um but one i, I need to watch one of these that i haven't seen from the this new hitchcock well i know oh, I right it. yeah i know yeah. i showed it off but uh we're definitely going to be doing hitchcock in we at one point yeah uh, got, we've got to cover friends yeah, anyway that that fits with the jello yeah yeah, um sure you got me kind of wanting to watch clockwork orange now as well um yeah i got it so i watched I, that sean clark just, video when he does all the locations yeah that so me is and, fucking amazing so uh yeah like i said we'll be covering that tuesday night on gore's channel uh 8 p.m eastern standard time and uh it ought to be good man it's uh Every time I see it, man, I see something different. Like just like almost every Kubrick film I watch, uh, there's always something else that I didn't see before, and the old brain wheels get to clicking. And <laughs> you know. yeah, because we're gonna do The Shining, didn't we? At one point, yeah. And um, I think like invite Gore on as well. For yeah, that. Gore's coming on to do That'd The Shining amazing. when we do The Shining. Uh, for like sure. we'll and we'll do it like a proper fucking deep dive. Yeah, this it's gonna be, be like a our, show. Yeah, it's going to be, yeah. Yeah. Just like, you know, clockwork. So, uh, eyes wide shut as well. We covered eyes that. Eyes wide shut. Yeah. Just like that. Let's see. Um, Gore said, it's hard, man. I've, I've got a 17 year old and like to spend a lot of time with him too. So it's hard. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. Okay. Grayson, he's, he's yeah. about to be seven and he's finally starting to watch films like all the way through. So it's kind of fun for me to to find these classic films that I know that he's gonna love, and just to see his reaction of watching them because like uh, that's that's the enjoyment I get out of it, you know. <laughs> like I don't know. Yeah, that's definitely yeah. And who knows in the future he might he may be able to come on at some point, you know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. That, that would be awesome. That would. Right. Yeah. Let's see. Yeah, Wrangler says have no kids. Yeah, man. I hear you. Uh, did you order the House of Doom set from Cauldron? I did, man. And uh, there's a reason. You know? It's kind of high. And I don't know, man. I just I thought that it was going to be... I don't know. I was thinking a different price point. And plus, it's not probably going to be here till July. So, uh, yeah, I don't yeah. know. That's my issue with it. Because yeah. I, I would, I would quite happily spend one hundred and thirty dollars tonight if I knew I'd get the film next week. Yeah. Um, so I've held off. I know I'm going to regret it, but um. Okay, Gore's saying uh, that that that's going to be a pre-recording. Okay. Oh okay. yeah, you you one for Tuesday, yeah, yeah. For for Tuesday, so okay, my bad, y'all. Yeah, but. Yeah, we can properly get it edited. I guess to edit and everything, so that'd be good. So, who's, so it's going to be you, Gore. Is um, JT yeah, just me and Gore. One? I think. Oh, okay. Yeah. 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 But um, uh, but yeah, man. Um, you want to bring up anything else? Anything we need to cover? Talk about? Anybody got any questions? Yeah, um, I'm okay for a bit. If everyone else is, um, yeah. Just stop, man. That's all I can say. I'm still on a buzz because of that. But um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, have you got any ideas for like future guests and stuff? 
um or yeah, just we'll, you know general like collabs and yeah we could we'll we'll figure it out um yeah we just have to behind the scenes talk about all that figure it out talk yeah yeah people, you know um uh, have to get cool to to pick a subject and we'll do like three yeah. films and, and get them on yeah because i mean we mentioned the 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 um well gord mentioned it a while back about doing the the um what is it channel bounce i like that right. idea. yeah that yeah channel bounce yeah. idea with jt and uh i think that'd be cool man uh let's see mm. we all got home lives so it takes a lot of work and love to make the time for our youtube shows maybe Sometimes it gets to be too much and need a break. Yeah, man. And that's kind of like why, you know, for me at the moment, it's like a once a week kind of thing um, on, on on the channel, you know. Uh, but let's see. Brian says, is Darren tired yet? <laughs> I seen the Turk earlier, yeah, because I didn't go to bed till like 8, 8 a.m. Uh, yeah. UK time. Believe it or not, yeah. man, after yesterday, like this has been pretty overwhelming the past couple of days. <laughs> like, yeah. yeah, you know, winning the horror YouTuber, that was cool. Really super hyped for that. And all the all the great people, man, uh, that makes this thing happen. And uh, I didn't get much sleep either. It's crazy. I didn't go to bed till like three. I woke up at like seven. Same. So, I got a few uh, hours. I got like and four hours sleep. So, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> Gore says, you can join us, Darren. Okay. Um, Tuesday, yeah. I've got the thing with Dana, so I know I've got a couple of films I gotta watch for Dana on the Thursday. Okay. So um I won't say yeah, I don't I don't want to commit and like let people down the last minute. Right. Um but if you could like the next one, give me like a week in advance or something, or you know, I can I can do that. Yeah. I'm just as much as I like Clockwork Orange, and I do love Clockwork Orange, I don't know whether I'd have loads to say on it. Like I would the shining or or you know. Um but yeah, keep me in mind for the next one if you can. If it's something up my alley, then definitely I will, yeah. Thanks, Gore, anyway, for asking. Yeah, man. And then and, and I know that uh I know uh Brian, you know, we, we were talking about the, the coffin Joe set at some point. Yeah, I was gonna say Brian as well, get him on as well, because uh, we mentioned it last yeah. night. Yeah. Um but I'll try and make the uh, at least try and make the chat for go for for when you watch that, you know. Okay. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, and he says Canali Rimbalzo. Yeah, I would never remember that, but I'll try to remember now. Channel bounce. That's uh, channel bounce in Italian. Canali Rimbalzo. <laughs> Sounds good. He says. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. I don't like to commit to anything unless I know one hundred percent as well and uh yeah i don't want to let people down because right um, i don't like letting people down either man that's that's the thing uh with me i'm fine if i got like a week in advance so i can really yeah I, as, as dirt knows i won't half ass anything i want to be prepared yeah because if i say it happen. it's gonna happen that's that's just me like yeah do what you say you're gonna do you know that's where i was talking like the stuff with dan as well i said to dan yeah. um as long as i get a few days it's not so bad, you know, with those Grand Ace films. Mm -hmm. um, but obviously, I've got stuff with Dana. Um, I'm sure we're going to be doing something Saturday. Yeah. Um, I've then got Richard, I think, the following Saturday on a podcast, but that we can, like, tie it in and do a show around that as well. So. And Charlie's um, saying, Charlie88, man, uh, with with the Blood Harvest, uh, Tiny Tim <laughs> profile. Uh, yeah, yeah. Missed the beginning of the stream, but we'll rewatch it later. It's a work weekend for me. You guys are awesome. We'll have to get some sleep now. Yeah, man. Yeah. Yeah, just I any mean, time, man. Valley 88 has been a massive supporter yeah. in terms of commenting on YouTube and, and all that. Yeah, um, yeah man. Uh, just pleased to have you, man, on board. For sure, man. Uh, as everyone. Everyone in the chat is also. I mean, we. Yeah. luckily enough, we've had you know, no trouble with real like you know trolls or we had one like little that. troll last night but you know i was i'll still read their comment and i'll still yeah yeah you know, whatever <laughs> you know i didn't I, even read that what they say 
it was some stupid like something about AIDS or something. I don't know. Oh yeah, yeah. I remember you saying that. Yeah, yeah. Um, let's see. Yeah, Gore saying, "Say what you mean and mean what you say," for sure, man. Always. I like, mean, yeah. Me and Dirk been talking about that the last couple yeah. of weeks, and I, I think you've got to be straight with people. Yeah. Um. I think people respect you more, you know, for being straight. That's yeah. my the way I look at it. I'd rather someone be straight with me and say, look, I can't do this, or then fucking string you along and do you know what I mean? Um yeah. so that's what me and Dirk have said, you know, the last couple of weeks we're gonna just be straight with people, be you know, support everyone we can in this right. community. And um, and I can't yeah. like it's it's impossible to watch everything I try. My best to like to, to comment, like, and and jump into people's stuff, but time is limited sometimes, you know. And uh, when I'm at work and n- nobody's around me, I can I can I can just gorge all kind of content, you know. <laughs> but uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, and, and for me as well, it's hard like with different people's streams. If I don't know them personally, I tend not to comment. But now I've got the last like. 24 hours or so i've got to talk you know with go yeah um and i'll hopefully jt as well because i really like his channel a lot and hopefully yeah. i can kind of you know get talking to him and um of course you've got chris you've got all the all the regulars as well um anthony gizmo yeah. um once i'm comfortable with someone then i'm yeah you know. oh yeah man I, I forgot man uh i would i i completely forgot to do it while we was on the stream but uh yeah, y'all don't forget to. Uh... Okay, that's enough. Is that a new one? Or... <laughs> yeah, that's a new that's one awesome. I made. <laughs> <laughs> Shit. That is awesome, man. Yeah, I don't know. I I don't know how I feel about that one because uh, the other one's pretty hardcore. But, uh, let's see. Yeah, Gore says, uh, if you don't have your word, then you don't have no- anything. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's exactly. true, man. Like in uh, like there's this movie that we've been hammering. Uh, me and Gizmo have been hammered Darren to watch for a while called scarface i don't know if y'all ever heard of it you know yeah but uh yeah so he's got he's got that line in there he says all i have in this world is my balls and my word and i don't break them for no one right you know, yeah it's one, of, one of the great quotes from tony montana you know but uh exactly that's the way to be man you've yeah. got to be you've got to be straight i think certainly on youtube anyway yeah with, with people and but supportive and all that as well you know, and while you're fine with me and dirt, we won't be an asshole about anything. Yeah. You know? Well I'll try not to be anyway. Gore said it scared the shit out of him. Yeah. Start watching VHS eighty five Dirk and Darren. I don't think I've ever seen that one. I've seen some of the VHS. I'm not a big found footage guy. I I'm just, not. Yeah. I do like the first uh VHS, the one with the whatever creature woman i like that one kind of uh but other than that i'm not a big fan footage it's just i've my seen thing. the one with the rat is it the rat man like se- segment i've yeah. seen that one i didn't particularly like them to be honest yeah he said uh scarface to palma yeah hell yeah man yep and uh texas says no censorship here day one motherfucker yeah that's another thing. Like you were, there, there will be no censorship on this channel whatsoever. No. Anyone's welcome to say, you know, I say fuck a lot. Anyone's welcome to say whatever they want at any time. You'll never be deleted. Yeah, no. Yeah, I, I don't believe in that. censorship at all. Yeah, I'm not with that shit. But, but yeah, man, I could. We're uh over the two hour mark, man. Uh. Do y'all want to bring up anything else? I guess we can get out of here if there ain't nothing else to oh, talk I'm about. Good, I, don't want to, yeah. I don't want to bore people to sleep. You know, like. No, we don't, we don't want to keep rambling. Um, yeah. If anyone's got any more quick questions, like, then right. go for it. Yeah. 
You gotta get gotta get some of that. Yeah, that's just a mainstay kind of deal. And then... Bastard! <laughs> Oh God! <laughs> I'm not yeah, man. I was surprised that Ali was okay with that clip, actually, because I would imagine that's quite hard for a woman to watch that bottle scene. Yeah, but she was yeah. laughing last night, so that's a good thing. I yeah, should have Tasha. She laughed laugh too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, no one's going to be offended on with what we say anyway. I doubt. Oh. Uh. Yeah. Yours says making sure that YouTube didn't remove my comment. Yeah. Bastard. I use that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's great, man. But yeah, I don't want to keep rambling and like still kind of like holy shit. That was a great show, man. I, th I felt like it was. So. Wrangler got a good question. Okay. Yeah. Lost on Island and only one Jolly Dirk and Darren. Oh, for me, it's going to be uh, your vice. Your vice is a lot of room and only I have the key. The, the shirt that I'm wearing, <laughs> shit. I mean, I could answer it two different ways. Like, if you if you want me to answer it, like, with, like, an island-themed jello as well, oh. I would probably say $5 for an August moon. But if this kind of is the only film I can watch, on an, yeah. I, it would be opera all day long for me. Okay. Argento's opera. Yeah. But that's a great question. I could give you 10 different answers on 10 different days. Well, but... you can't have 10, though. You can only yeah, have no, one. Yeah, yeah, you can only have one. <laughs> but, um, well, I'll give you two, but yeah. Uh, opera for me, then, I'd say, if I had to push uh, my neck out. Right. Um, oh, Texas. Uh, this one I got, I think, I think it was Red Bubble. I think because, uh, yeah, I think it was Red Bubble. If not, it was, uh, what is it? The Tea, tea Spring, I think, or Red Bubble, one of the two. Let's see. I, I only think I've got one horror shirt. I need to get on that, you know, and start. But the thing is, a lot of these companies are in America. Yeah. And I'm such an impatient bastard. Like, I. You know, I can't wait like two weeks for something to arrive. I'm, I'm terrible. But um, they, they take a while sometimes. But I mean, you know. I want to get the Euro Cult one. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah. Dirk Speaking mentioned of that. maybe doing one for the channel. But, Speaking of that, I, I did get know. another Euro Cult shirt. So we got Euro Cult. Yeah, yeah. Uh, not this Sunday, but next Sunday. Oh, God. Yeah. Murder Rock as well. Yeah. We're going to cover Murder Rock. Well, what's people's thoughts in the chat about Murder Rock? I just I just got this one in, though. This is my my new uh, Eurocult. See, that design is superb, I think. Because I, I love that. I got yeah. a blue one, and now I got a black one. So. And then, yeah, uh, I will. Maybe next sale, I will definitely. And I, I did get this. Of that. So they had a sale going on. So I got this one as well. Yeah. Dead Pit, man. People go and support Dead Pit as well. Yeah. Those guys was doing this, was the first people I know to be doing this. Right. Um, and there's no way we'd be talking now if it weren't for Dead Pit. Right. No, 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 no doubt about it, man. No doubt about it. But yeah, I just got those in today. But uh, it's either Red Bubble or Teespring or like uh, whatever. I think that's the name of the store. But yeah, man, I guess we'll get out of here. I appreciate everybody, man. And uh, you have a good rest of the weekend. Uh, try not to get lost in any dark alleys, you know. Uh, and go and vote as well. Go vote. Go and vote on the YouTube. <laughs> don't, uh, don't trust women with, uh, tat with uh, dagger tattoos. And, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and especially the ones that like to flutter their eyes, their eyelashes a lot. Be very weary of those. So, uh, we're going to get out of here, man. Uh, yeah. Have a good one, guys. And um, we'll be back next week with some more yeah. like Jalo talk. Caveman. Okay, Appreciate it, man. Congratulations. Uh, yeah, yeah. Thanks, Caveman. Okay, yeah. Y'all take it easy, man. No problem, Tex. See y'all later, man.
Have a good one, guys. Later, Wrangler. Let's see.